142. Ms. Danath, are you on the line? Yes, I'm right here. I keep muting myself accidentally. Okay, great. I'm ready. All right, great. So we're going to go back on record in the proceeding and uh, I believe there are two more Blue Cross Blue Shield witnesses. So Ms. AC or Mr. D'Onofrio, could you please call your next witness? Uh, yes, we're going to call Ruth Green and I'm just checking to see if she's in the meeting. Yeah. I believe she's I'm in listed the as too. unknown user. Oh, sorry. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Blue Cross calls uh, Ruth Green as its next witness. All right, I'm going to give folks just a, a minute to find Ruth uh, and pin her if that's what you're doing. Okay, Ms. Green, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, Ms. Acey? Could you please state your full name for the record? Bruce Green. Ms. Green, what is your position with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont? I hold the position of treasurer and chief financial officer. Would you please take a look at exhibit 12 in your binder? Yes. Is exhibit 12 your pre-filed testimony in this matter? Yes, it is. Do you affirm that it is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Uh, does your pre-filed testimony discuss matters related to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserves, its proposed contribution to reserves, and the appropriateness of the proposed rates? Yes, it does. Uh, and in your pre-filed testimony, did you explain why you directed Mr. Schultz to include a 1.5 contribution to reserves in the filed rate? Yes, I did. As of January 1, 2020, was Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserve level below the range that is required by the Department of Financial Regulation? Yes, it is. Uh, you discussed this point in more detail in your pre-filed testimony, but could you please briefly summarize for the board why it is important for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to reach the point where its reserves are within the required range? Yes, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont required, is, is required to maintain reserves and stay solvent so that we can pay the claims for our members, pay for their health care. And as Commissioner Pichek has uh, told the board many times that uh, insurer solvency is the um, most important aspect of consumer protection. We also need reserves, as Paul had indicated in his testimony, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to have the resources to be able to invest in um, programs and initiatives that bend the cost curve. Also, um, uh, we need the flexibility to um, address the needs of Vermont markets, in particular the, the senior market, and Paul outlined the uh, investment in Vermont Blue Advantage and the uh, Medicare Advantage market. Uh, that's currently an underserved market in Vermont with only 16% of uh, Vermonters buying Medicare Advantage, but we believe um, we can bring that up to um, closer to the national levels by having a, a blue network in a Medicare Advantage plan. So um, reserves are required to um, allow us to serve all the markets that we serve. Um, we also um, have a, a study that was done to determine the appropriate range for our business is uh, unique to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and it's uh, based on the risk profile of our business. And in that same study that was uh, reviewed uh, by Oliver Wyman and DFR and resulted in the ordered range, um, it was noted that the place in the range that we should aspire to be 
on a consistent basis is 690% reserves that would lead to an RBC of 690%, um, so that in any given year, it would um, reduce the chances that we'd fall outside the target range. Um, and do reserves uh, play a role with respect to losses in particular lines of business? Yeah, so um, as uh, the testimony earlier from Paul um, around the purpose of reserves, reserves is um, the uh, protection for all of the uncertainties and risks um, for our business, and that's for all of our lines of business. So to the extent that the individual and small group um, uh, risk pool has sustained losses over the last several years, um, those have also come out of reserves. As other witnesses and the board have discussed today, the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event. Has the experience of the pandemic changed the way that you think about reserves? Uh, yes and no. Um, I'll say no first. Um, when we think about reserves, their protection against uncertainties and risk. And as we've uh, explained before to the board, the um, pandemics and natural disasters are a classic example of things that reserves are intended to protect against. So um, in some ways, that's, that's exactly um, what the reserves are there for. Um, we need to be there when our, our members need us the most, and to the extent that um, those reserves are consistently maintained with a, a modest CTR of 1.5%, that is what um, sustains over time. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think we are thinking about reserves a little bit differently. Um, the pandemic has really been a learning experience for everyone, um, and as we uh, partnered with the state of Vermont and providers and our employer customers to uh, deal with the stay-at-home orders and the various uh, things that had to be adapted to respond in the case of the pandemic. We really did have to um, uh, focus our resources where it was needed most and uh, reserves play an important role in being able to uh, bring that flexibility to the healthcare system. Um, in your pre-filed testimony, uh, you explained why the proposed rates satisfy the statutory criteria? Yes. Is it your opinion uh, that the board should approve an average rate increase of 5.5%? Yes, it is my opinion that the uh, rate increase of 5.5% should be approved. Why? There's no uh, debate that the rates are actuarially sound. Paul went through that and shared the l &E view. Um, we are highly confident that the rate reflects the co expected cost of care in 2021, with the exception, as Paul noted, um, for the, the COVID claims. Um, and there's no padding in these rates. There's uh, a very modest CTR and the administrative cost ratio is very efficient and there's no profit margin included in these rates. So um, the, the rate of rate increase of 5.5% is what I would say needs to be approved. Um, and what has been Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's overall experience with this line of business? The um, Paul went through um, several areas of testimony that outlined how the uh, this line of business has lost uh, money over the last um, several years. And uh, in the exhibits that were submitted as part of the pre-filed testimony, uh, we showed that that was about $12.5 million, uh, even if you include the um, uh, litigation recoveries, this line of business has significantly lost money uh, since its inception. Um, this is a slight um, change of track, but as we're talking about the rates, there was some um, testimony earlier, I think you heard uh, with Mr. Schultz and, uh, and board members regarding fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, do you recall that testimony? I do. Is there anything you'd like to add to um, Mr. Schultz's explanation? Sure. Um, I thought it would be helpful to the, the board and the healthcare advocate that um, 
when we talk about, and as Paul indicated in his actuarial mem memorandum, that the cost containment programs were suspended or um, came to a halt, um, in large part that was due to um, removing the burden on um, providers. Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Is, it seems like someone may have forgotten to take themselves, put themselves on mute. Can you still hear me? I can't hear you. Can, but there's, it sounds like someone's driving. Um, could everyone who's on the line please check their computers and their phones to make sure they're muted? It looks like it could be coming from Lucy. Lucy Garen, can you mute? Good. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I think I was just following up on the uh, testimony about the fraud, waste, and abuse programs that had come to a halt. Um, part, the um, Department of Financial Regulation issued an insurance order that required us, and I, I made a note, um, on March 16th, it was uh, the DFR Insurance Bulletin 211 um, that um, required us to um, sort of get out of the way, if you will, of the providers in terms of um, spending time with them on those programs. So um, we will get those back into play as soon as we're allowed to. Ms. Green, um, if you could take a look at the Lewis and Ellis report, uh, which is Exhibit 9 in your binder. Yep, I'm there. Um, so you had mentioned earlier that um, administrative costs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont are low compared to other plans. Are you familiar with LNE's analysis of the administrative costs reflected in the proposed rate? Yes, their um, analysis, I believe, is on pages um, 19 and 20. And do you have any response to their analysis? Yes, I, I uh, concur with their conclusion um, that the revised expense assumptions are reasonable and appropriate. And I noted that, uh, as Paul had indicated, uh, LNE had done a survey of other uh, blue plans that operate in the individual and small, small group markets. And so on page 20, it does talk about the uh, percentage on a percentage of premium basis. We had lower expenses than 90% of other of the blue plans who were in their survey. But um, I'd also wanted to point out that the administrative costs on a PM PM basis um, are lower than 82% of the plans that they surveyed. What this tells me is what I already know about how we operate our our company. We are very focused on operating efficiency. It's a key portion of um, everyone's uh, daily work. Uh, we're uh, constantly looking at uh, programs and um, processes to make sure that we're doing them as efficiently as possible. Uh, in fact, we have one employee-based program called Blue Ideas that has produced about $5 million of savings over five years. That program is actually evolving to be uh, more proactively looking at processes and taking manual work out of those processes and uh, making things more efficient. But as an enterprise in total, we manage our costs across all of our books of business and we've been consistently able to um, serve all of our customers with uh, operating expenses at 7%, less than 7% of um, premium on a consistent basis. Uh, when we do our own benchmarking externally, um, that uh, compares to other commercial insurers of about 10.7%. So that, that's a median of some of those external surveys. Um, the other thing is when we are uh, doing the programs like the ones that uh, Dr. McIntosh and Paul testified about, uh, we are constantly allocating our staff towards the higher priority items and away from 
um, lower priority items or, or programs that have um, uh, been, you know, analyzed and uh, understood to be less of less value. So, uh, as Paul testified, the rate increase for 2021 would have been 1.7 percent higher if it weren't for some of the programs that we've implemented. Um, for 2021, and that really does take um, the resources and the the active uh, allocation of our staff to um, go towards bending the cost curve. You indicated in your pre-filed testimony that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont had not made a final decision about pay increases for 2021. Is there anything you can add to that? Yes. Um, one thing I just wanted to um, point out, which we've shared with the board in the past, is that the uh, impact of the average salary increases at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is, um, in fact, very, very small impact on any given year's rate increase. If we eliminated the average salary increase in 2021, it would have an effect of reducing the premium increase by 3 twentieths of 1%. Um, nonetheless, we do recognize the extreme financial stresses that everyone is under in Vermont and uh, with the pandemic and the um, stay at home orders and the economic um, uh, slowdown and everyone working as hard as they can to adapt. Um, we do recognize we have to put a new lens on our plans for 2021 as everyone is. Um, and. We're still working on ideas, but the executives at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont have already uh, come to the conclusion that they will commit to not having salary increases in 2021 for the executive team, and we're looking at other options. Um, so we remain committed to a strong, motivated workforce. You also indicated um, earlier, I believe, that l &E had found the 1.5% CTR assumption in the rate to be reasonable. Um, are you familiar with l &E's analysis of the proposed CTR contribution in the rate? Yes, I am. It's, uh, it starts on page 20 and goes uh, into 21 and 22. Do you have any uh, response to l and um, comparison of the proposed CTR to other plans? Yes, I, I was struck by the uh, information that they pulled together. They looked at the filings and on uh, the middle of page 21. They uh, looked at the 783 qualified health plan filings and uh, compared, looked at the average submitted CTRs. The median CTR that was submitted um, was 3.24 and the average was 3.45. And uh, they, based on their analysis, our modest CTR contribution to reserve of one and a half percent is um, lower than 80% of um, those filings. Did uh, l &E consider Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserve levels as part of its analysis? Yes, they went on on that same section to look at reserves. They looked at them from uh, several different points of view. They actually uh, compared to other companies um, on several metrics, four metrics in particular, and all of those uh, assessments concluded that our reserves are low, which um, is consistent with what um, my understanding is. And in fact, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. At the bottom of page uh, 21, I wanted to point out um, one in particular point that they shared was that um, over half the blue plans had actual RBCs higher than Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's targeted maximum. And said another way, that, that means that even if we were at the top of our range, um, we would be lower than half the other blue plans where they currently sit today. Did Eleni address the um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's historical CTR for this line of business? Yes, they did at the top of that same page. Uh, this is a table actual to expected contribution to reserve. This is a table that's not unlike the table that Paul testified about earlier today. And, sorry, I was just making sure that wasn't me. Um, 
the actual to expected uh, table does indicate that uh, we've uh, lost money on this uh, book of business. And I did, um, as Paul had mentioned earlier, but uh, I'd like to draw out LNE's comment that um, LNE believes, this is right above the table, um, that the results demonstrate that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has successfully projected future results based on the information available at the time final rates are approved by the board. So what's important here is that um, when we're estimating the rates for 2021, um, it's important to recognize that um, we've been consistent in our ability to um, project those costs. Um, and the other thing that this table shows is that when the um, board cuts the rates below the actuarially sound levels, uh, it does result in uh, losses to the company, or at least in, uh, it does not uh, achieve the CTR. And in many years, four out of the six, it resulted in losses. If the board um, cuts the proposed rate this year, will it reduce the cost of health care that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is required to cover? No, it won't. Uh, Ms. Green, I'd like to direct you to Exhibit 10. If you, could you identify Exhibit 10, please? Exhibit 10 is the um, solvency opinion from DFR, and it includes, by reference, the, uh, the letter from Oliver Wyman in support of that solvency opinion. Um, have you reviewed the Oliver Wyman report? I have. And that begins on page seven of Exhibit 10? It does. Um, has Oliver Wyman changed its uh, position regarding an appropriate target range for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserves? No, they haven't. On the bottom of page seven, they do outline that um, this report was an update on the previous work that they had done in support of the uh, proposed surplus range at the time of 590 to 745. Does Oliver Wyman agree that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserves are below the required range as of December 31st, 2019? Yes, they do. On page nine of exhibit 10, they um, note that as of December 31st, 2019, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's RBC ratio of 567 was 23 points below the low end of the approved range. Uh, and do you have any response to um, Oliver Wyman's analysis of this point? Um, it was important, and I think it's important for the board to understand that the the increase in RBC during 2019 uh, was primarily due to the receipt of the alternative minimum tax uh, rebate and or refund. And um, Oliver Wyman made a point that uh, the nearly all of the increase was due to that one time item. So that is important from my perspective because it doesn't change the uh, fundamentals of having a adequately um, priced book of business. Does Oliver Wyman also compare Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's reserve levels to other comparable companies? They do. Um, on the next page, they uh, updated the comparative analysis that they had included in their previous report. And they uh, confirm at the bottom of page 10 that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's RBC ratio in 2019 is the lowest of all the comparative companies. They also pointed out um, that during the period of 2016 to 2018 on that page, um, the average of the companies excluding Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont had increased pretty significantly over that time frame, whereas our RBC had decreased. That's important to note. What did Oliver Wyman conclude about the outlook for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's RBC? Um, Oliver Wyman's conclusion is on uh, page 16, but they did conclude that there's a strong likelihood that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont will remain under the 590 low end of the target surplus range at the end of 2021. Um, if the overall impact of the uh, COVID-19 uh, claims utilization is relatively modest, which is what Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has uh, modeled. Paul had uh, testified earlier about the 
um, taking on the feedback from Oliver Wyman and re updating the modeling and uh, seeing that it, it still had a, a pretty significant impact. They go on to say, um, importantly, that any negative adjustment to the proposed premium levels will increase the likelihood that the 2021 RBC ratio uh, will fall out, fall below the target RBC range. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has experienced a reduction in claims so far this year because of the pandemic. Why didn't Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont reduce or eliminate its rate increase for 2020 run to reflect those lower claims costs so far in 2020? As I outlined in my pre-filed testimony, um, to take a step like that at this point would be um, premature. There's a, we're only a few months into uh, the pandemic and um, no one knows how that's going to unfold. Uh, if for some reason as the, the future um, comes to pass and there's um, uh, the end result of the 2020 and 2021 claims activity due to the COVID pandemic results in um, monies in surplus that could be refunded. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But at this point, it's just simply premature to, to take that step. Um, it certainly with all the uncertainties that are in our current future surrounding our surplus and solvency, it would be imprudent to take that step now. Did you include in your pre-filed testimony an outlook for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's uh, risk-based capital at the end of 2021? I did, and in fact, it's the same RBC outlook that um, Paul and um, the, the board were looking at in the earlier testimony um, this morning. And in Exhibit 12, that's page 37? Yes. So it's the same exhibit that we were looking at earlier. So this, um, I wanted to um, further elaborate on this um, RBC outlook. The, there are many, many uncertainties. And as you can see from scanning down through this um, analysis on page 37, that there are a lot of uncertainties and there are a lot of big inflows and outflows that have to do with um, our future uh, RBC level. So we put this together with the express purpose to help um, people understand what the, the 12 to 24 month view might look like and how we're seeing it. And in the interest of transparency, we just wanted to make sure that everyone had the benefit of what we see. And what I see here is a lot of, um, a lot of things that have yet to come to fruition and uh, a lot of things that none of us know how to predict at this point in terms of how the pandemic will unfold. Um, so um, the end result that uh, was really to be focused on on this exhibit was the estimated RBC at the end of December 31st of 2021. Um, and this also incorporates uh, obviously the scenarios that Paul modeled on the pandemic which was, as Paul indicated, and I can reiterate, was an illustration of what could happen, not that we know which, which uh, scenario will pan out, but just to give some sense of what the order of magnitude could look like. So for the, the five different uh, COVID modeling scenarios and incorporating the other variables, um, the range at the end of 2021 is from um, 545 going down to 419 at the bottom. Um, you may have heard earlier um, with respect to um, one item that's uh, on this RBC outlook, you may have heard in um, Mr. Angoff's opening a discussion of the potential recoveries in risk corridor and cost sharing litigation. Um, would you describe those uh, potential recoveries should Blue Cross receive them as a windfall? Absolutely not. I don't view those as a windfall at all. Um, those are uh, payments that were part of the original ACA design when the qualified health plans were rolled out and the federal government um, didn't come through on those payments. So that is in part 
um, a contributor to the losses that we've experienced. So these are recoupments, if you will, of the uh, payments that we would have expected. And when in my pre-file testimony, when I showed the losses on this book of business being a little over $12 million, I assumed that these payments came back to us. So even with these payments, the qualified health plans have um, lost $12 million and that has come out of surplus. So it's not a windfall at all. It's, it's recouping something that was really uh, a part of our um, business strategy for participating in this market. Um, also on the subject of reserves, in your pre-file testimony, you stated that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has committed to paying pandemic costs for 2021 out of reserves. Does that commitment include additional temporary hospital commercial rate increases if the board approves such increases later this year? At the time we said that, it did not include the, um, the eventuality if it happens um, for special allowances for the hospital budgets. Um, we, I, as I sit here today, I would not recommend those uh, special uh, increases. And the reason is the, um, if it's important for us to take a, a 12 to 24 month view on the impact of the pandemic on Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's solvency, I think it's reasonable to take a longer view on where the hospitals will end up. Um, if, if the increase in claims that Paul mentioned and we've seen in our June and July results or July payments, um, if that continues, uh, I do think that we need to, to take a a um, longer view uh, with respect to what's appropriate. If if there were some special allowances approved, um, I'd have to say it would have to go into the rates because that is not incorporated anywhere in our, our um, thinking yet. Is the impact of the loss in value of pension assets including included in the RBC outlook? Yes, it is, as we talked about earlier today. If not for uh, the pension asset losses, could or would Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont have reduced its contribution to reserves in this rate? No, we would not have. Um, again, I'd like to emphasize that this RBC outlook was to give people a sense of the level of uncertainty that's out there um, in the next 12 to 24 months. It's not um, an expectation of what, it's not a, a point projection of what we think the RBC will be. Um, but if you do take, as, as we began this morning, um, if you take the pension loss out of the numbers that I mentioned a moment ago at the bottom of that page, the RBC range would be um, 599 to 725. And um, that is very much still within the, the target range. And it wouldn't be until we're consistently and predictably expected to be you know, at the top or, or above the range that we would consider reducing the 1.5% the, um, CTR. The 1.5% CTR, which I say in the rate filing um, for Paul's benefit, and then also in my pre-filed testimony, that 1.5% is a long-term consistent maintenance of reserves so that we ensure that um, the uh, book of businesses is, is, is supporting itself. And then uh, to the extent that we have other things coming and going in the reserves, um, we don't wanna be swinging our rates around as a result of that. So the one and a half percent is really where I would have landed even without the pension loss. Mr. Angoff stated in his uh, opening that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is benefiting from the pandemic. Do you agree with that opinion? I take issue with the words that we're benefiting from a pandemic. I don't think anybody's benefiting from a pandemic. Our employees are working from home and trying to homeschool their children and um, you know, take care of their, their family while they're also serving our customers. I don't think Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has benefited from the pandemic. If by way of um, benefiting, Mr. Angoff um, is referring to the lowdown in claims as a result of the shutdown and the stay at home order, um, as the analysis has uh, shown and how, as Paul 
described, uh, we believe that in the fullness of um, 2020 and 2021, um, all of those, many of those services need to be paid for. And uh, so we're here, we'll be here when those um, payments need to be made. Um, it's not benefiting Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. It's, it's been benefiting our customers. I'd like to also just point out briefly that um, not everyone understands that when um, the providers had the slowdown in um, mid-March, April, May, and into June, and actually coming back online in June, um, the only monies that go into our reserves for future payments are for the insured business. We have a large book of self-funded business. And so the claim slowdown that comes out of the hospital revenues related to the self-funded business actually goes back and, and remains with those self-funded employers. So um, just to be clear about where, where the claim slowdown flows through in, in terms of the current economy. I have no further questions for Ms. Green at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Ms. Green? Yes, I do. Good afternoon, Ms. Green. Hello. Uh, I want to emphasize, I'm going to ask you several questions. I want to emphasize, and I hope you understand, none of this is personal. It's just business. None of it's personal. Second, and please take this seriously, I'm not interested in communications between you and your attorneys. If I ask a question and something that you've said to your attorney, your attorney has said to you is relevant, please do not tell me about those. Any other communication is, is, is what I want to hear about. Do you understand that? Sure. Okay. Um, in your capacity as treasurer and CFO is Blue Cross, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, are you responsible for Blue Cross's investment policy? Um, the Finance Committee of our board is responsible for the investment policy, but as Treasurer and Chief Financial Officer, I am uh, charged with implementing that. Yep. Okay. And who is on that uh, committee? It's a subcommittee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont board. And, and who is on it? Um, so we have uh, Scott Giles. Um, and what's his position? He is CEO of the VSAC organization. We have uh, Joe Bradley, who is former um, Vermont uh, Economic Development Organization. Um, sorry, not Economic Development Organization. Um, I'll have to get you her title. Um, we have... Um, Shoot, I'm sorry. I, there's five members, and I can get the names for you. Okay. Will you please submit those to the board? Yeah. Good. And so are you one of those five members? I'm not a member of the board, no. Okay. But I'm, then, I'm management, and I, re, you know, report to the board. Okay. So who, so, so who makes the decision as to what Blue Cross's investment policy should be? I'm just going to object um, on the grounds of relevance um, that Blue Cross's investment policies for its um, its assets are not relevant to this proceeding. And I, I believe it's been noted that we have some time issues here. Mr. Angoff, what, what is the relevancy of this line of questioning? Well, we want to, I think, we want to find out who is responsible. We don't want, anyway, I won't speak for the board, but if, if Ms. Green is responsible, then uh, um, I'm happy to hear from Ms. Green, if, if, uh, and we should hear from Ms. Green. On the other hand, if there's a committee that's responsible and Ms. Green is not responsible, then the question should be, why are the responsible parties not here testifying before this board? May I respond to that? Um, of course. So I'm not exactly sure what Mr. Angoff is talking about responsibility for. Um, I don't believe there's an issue here with regard to the um, investment policies that Blue Cross uses for its um, its own investments. If this is referring to the pension matter, um, 
that is a different matter. Um, and I would make, I would object on several grounds. And the first is um, we have taken the position consistently here, and I refer back to Don George's letter um, that went to the board members and to the, um, that the HCA received, where we asked that if the board or the HCA had questions about the pension asset loss matter, that we be given an opportunity to respond to them in writing. And we reiterated that in the written filing. The HCA has never objected to that, nor given us any um, written questions or proffered those to the board that would have been open to them. They did not follow that. Um, and second, I would reiterate that those questions as well are both um, irrelevant to this proceeding beyond the amount of the loss which has been disclosed um, and um, to the and you begin to move into areas um, that fall within attorney client privilege and work product. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Hick officer, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, after just saying this, the reason that the HCA didn't ask any questions is because the general counsel to the board asked questions and it asked exactly the right questions, exactly the right questions. And the answer that the board got, as I said in my opening, maybe not too artfully, was go jump in the lake. So I'm going to ask Ms. Green and see if I get any better answers. I think there's an objection on the on the table that I need to deal with it at the moment. So, um, I withdraw the question. Okay, Ms. Green, how did you guys lose forty million dollars? Objection for the same reasons I gave earlier. If you'd like me to restate them, I will. But but uh, so okay. So let's deal with these one at a time. The the grounds that the HCA did not. Um, file questions in writing or object to your request to do so, I don't think has any relevance. They are not obligated to do that. They have the opportunity to ask questions here at the hearing. Um, as to relevancy, I am um, struggling to find the relevancy with who specifically is responsible for the pension losses. Um, I don't think that is the board's role the board certainly has a legitimate interest in that um i think i think all policyholders have an interest in that um but it's not something that the board is going to be uh deciding in its in this rate case um so i i um i, I realize i sent those questions out on behalf of the board um but you know the board just like you guys can ask any questions they want, um, but we have a properly put objection here, and I, I think that line of questioning is not relevant. And Mr. Hearing Officer, yeah. I withdrew that question. Uh, my, my, the, the, the question pending to this line of this, this line of questioning is is going to draw further objections, I believe. So um, you can keep asking questions, but I, I suspect they'll keep drawing objections. Okay, and I will explain why those objections are unfounded and the, and the chair can rule. The, the question pending is, seems to me a very reasonable question. How did you lose 40 million bucks? Um, so just to, uh, my understanding is that I objected to that and it was ruled on um, by Mr. by the hearing officer. Uh, I, maybe I didn't follow that. Um, Sustained. That, right? yeah. okay. Ms. Green, what was the investment on which Blue Cross lost $40 million. Objection, relevance. Is that not in the record? I think it is in the record. In the response that we um, filed in Exhibit 22, which was a response to the questions, we, we responded to what we could respond to and um, feel as though um, the information was helpful, I hope, to the board um, to the extent that we could uh, make those responses. In that um, letter, we do talk about um, at the bottom of page four, the trust experienced a substantial line, uh, decline in value in February and March 2020 due to the poor performance of the assets invested in a series of funds managed by Allianz Global Investors. A substantial portion of the $40.6 million loss suffered by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont as of June 2nd reflects this investment loss. 
Um, the losses are distinct from general market losses that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we go on to show the table. So um, that is um, the extent of information that I've been told I can share at this point. Okay. Ms. Green, don't insurance companies, including Blue Cross, have an obligation to invest in prudent investments? Yes. Okay. Could you please explain then how the investment that lost $40 million was a prudent investment? I'm going to object on the same grounds of relevance and to the extent um, it's seeking information beyond what's provided in the written response. Uh, Mr. May I respond, Mr. Hearing Officer? You may. The, the reason all these questions are so relevant is that the board's decision, I believe, regarding this increase should depend in part on the extent to which this was just a unique uh, aberrational circumstance that Blue Cross could not have known about and therefore it was nobody's fault, or whether it was a reckless, negligent investment that involved sophisticated hedge fund analysis, uh, volatility funds, it, it, uh, things that I don't understand about various investment vehicles. But if it's a, if it's a very speculative, reckless investment, that I think is very relevant, should be relevant to what the board decides to do regarding this proposed rate increase. I would also, I also think just, I mean, the, the board, the board asked questions, very reasonable questions. It got no response. I don't know when the board found out about this investment, but it would seem to me that it was Blue Cross's obligation, if they're seeking a rate increase from the board, to let the board know as soon as possible, as soon as possible, what's happening, what, what happened to their, uh, th their surplus, which could affect the rate increase. So I think this whole line of questioning is extremely relevant. Ms. Acey, do you have any response to that? Yes, I have several responses. First, I'd like to read um, what we said in the filing on page six. The National Employee Benefits Committee is investigating the loss and has retained counsel to advise on the possibility of legal action to recoup all or a portion of the loss. That investigation is ongoing, and as a result, much of the information Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont receives as a result of the investigation reflects attorney-client communications and work product. So this line of questioning um, goes into a very delicate and privileged area that, um, in addition to not being relevant, that poses serious problems for pursuing it in this forum. Um, we also advise the board in our written response that the Department of Financial Regulation, who is the solvency and market regulator, is conducting an examination directed at the pension asset loss. So um, it is within their authority and is the subject of that um, proceeding. And um, again, it, this is not a forum in which the questions that Mr. Angoff wants to ask have any relevance. There is not a penny in this rate um, request that is based on the pension loss. Well, the, I mean, the pension loss is relevant and its impact on Blue Cross's solvency and how it impacts solvency, regardless of whether there's a, you know, specific ask in the rate to recoup, you know, because of the loss, um, because the board could decide that it would want to reduce the rate more and it wouldn't threaten Blue Cross's solvency, but for the pension loss. So, I mean, I think questions regarding the loss, questions about how the, um, how the, how it impacts solvency, how it impacts RBC over what time period, um, I think are, are certainly relevant. Um, I think the nature, of the investment um, sounds like it more is in the realm of DFR's authority and not the board's. Um, Mr. Angoff, you spoke about when the board knew. Um, I expect you have questions about that or when, sorry, when Blue Cross knew. Um, 
Um, but I guess there's not a question on the at the moment about that. So I'm not going to I'm not going to get there. But the so I, I don't I don't think the questions about the the fund are, are relevant. I'm sorry. I want to make that, I want to make sure I understand the chair's objection. You don't think the questions about the fund are relevant? Meaning I can't ask what what this investment was? No, I think that question was asked and answered. Did I misunderstand that? No. I, well, I'll, I'll ask this, and if you can rule on this. I mean, I understand what, an, what, what stocks are and an investment in stocks is. I understand what bonds are and what an investment in bonds is. I don't understand. I believe that this investment is neither. I believe it's a very arcane and, from what I've read, reckless type of investment to invest in. And I would like Ms. Green to, under, to explain what it is. I would think that we would all have an interest, and you all in particular would have an interest in finding out what, if you lose 40 million bucks, I would think you'd want to know what it is that was responsible for that loss. So that is the line of questioning to which we object. So I'm going to, board members, would you like to go into executive session to receive legal advice on this? Or do you, that is an option. Um, but my ruling is that um, it's not relevant to the rate decision otherwise. Would that mean that we could not even ask those questions under an executive session? That's correct. I think it might be helpful, um, Mike, if we go into if the board meets with you separately for just a couple minutes to so that there's clarity among board members about the line. But I would defer to Kevin since he's the chair. Uh, this is a little awkward because I'm also the, on the council, I'm also the hearing officer. So, um, and I don't think you should be put in the middle of this. Um, we can meet with yeah. Amarin, maybe. Yeah. You, yep, you could meet I, with I Amarin. I do not need to, but if Robin requests it, then I think we should. Because the board members have to feel comfortable. Mr. Hearing Officer, Lynn Combs is also on the line and happy to discuss with the board if that would be helpful. Robin, do you see great value in having this discussion? I think it will only take us five minutes and I think it'll speed things up later on because otherwise I, I think board members will be asking questions which will draw an objection and that Mike will then have to rule on. So I think it would be better if board members were clear in their mind about which areas of the pension uh, question were allowable and not and that might speed us along in the long run. So well, that I'm not going to be limited to what I can or can't ask by a consultation with, with a staff attorney. I'm still going to ask whatever questions I desire to ask. And if the hearing officer rules me out of order, then I will realize that I can't ask those questions. But I still plan on pursuing a line of questions on this. And it sounds like maybe it's not going to. Yeah, help. let's keep moving then. Okay. So okay. Ms. Green, what was the process that Blue Cross followed in? deciding to make the investment in whatever investment it was that lost this 40 million bucks. So I'm going to object on the same grounds to the extent it's requesting information beyond what's provided in the written statement. Well, that's not in the ground, grounds for an objection. So is the group I, objection I relevancy or? Yes, yeah, so the objection is based on relevancy and um, attorney client privilege and work product. Mr. Angoff? I'm, I'm 
began my questioning, emphasizing that I'm not interested in communications between Ms. Green or her lawyer. Lawyers. Yes, it does not appear to call for attorney-client privilege communication. I, I do think it is not relevant for the reasons I've already stated, so I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. When did you make the, when did Blue Cross make the investment that resulted in a $40 million loss? Not, I will again object on grounds of relevance here. Mr. Angoff, what is the relevance of when the investment was made? Just think it's, I think the board has a right to know as much as possible about this investment because how this investment occurred and what this investment was is something that I believe is should be relevant to the board's decision on this rate increase. Bridget, would it be helpful to just bring to the board's attention the response on page four that is part of the binder that describes starting at the top of page four um, that we participate in the National Retirement Trust and that's how investments are made? It's I just don't know if everyone on the board had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with that response. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Green. And, I, you know, I, maybe that is helpful um, to, I don't want to, though, interfere with Mr. Angoff's um, examination, but I do think the written response explains that this program is a national program that Blue Cross participates in as one of many participating plans. Um, and we did provide ample um, documentation to the board through the forms 5500 that provide quite a bit of detail. <coughs> Um, about the National Retirement Trust and its investment over time. Um, I, I, if that helps with the, with forestalling this line of questioning, I, I think that it should, given that it does, it provides that background, and that background is even more explained in the Form 5500s. Mr. Hearing Officer, I'll move on if, if, if the chair is going to continue to rule against me. Let me just, just say this. Are you all curious as to what this investment was? It's not every day that you lose 40 million bucks, that the value of a fund goes down 58.6%. I would like to know how that happened. So the board members will have an opportunity to ask their own questions, um, but do you want to ask another question? Yes. Uh, it, Ms. Green, after Blue Cross made this investment, did anyone at Blue Cross monitor it? No, object to the form of the question. It assumes facts, not in evidence. Could you restate the question? Yes. After Blue Cross made this investment, did anyone at Blue Cross monitor the investment? I don't think that calls for... So, <clears throat> Bridget, I'll, I'll, I'll again come back to our response in Exhibit 22, which talks about... Um, that the uh, investments are made through our participation in the National Retirement Trust, and we do receive monthly reports um, on those assets and uh, the returns on the assets as they're allocated to our portion of that trust. And did anyone at Blue Cross know the details of the investment, which resulted in a $40 million loss? going to object on grounds of relevance and to the extent it, the question is seeking information protected by the work product doctrine and attorney-client privilege. So the question was what again, Mr. Angoff? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chair. I was, uh, I was ready for you to, to uh, uphold the objection, and so I was looking for my next question. <laughs> Uh, I, I, so That's probably I, where I'm going, but I, I would just ask you to restate the question. Um, after you made, after Blue Cross made the investment, did anyone monitor the investment? I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Um, Ms. Green, are you familiar with the Vermont statute and regs specifying the types of investments insurers can make? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Okay. And do you believe that 
this investment that lost $40 million complied with those uh, statutes and regs. Object to the extent it calls for a legal conclusion by the witness. I just wanted to point out that the pension assets are invested as part of a um, trust that's um, under the ERISA laws. It's not under the insurance laws. Our Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont assets are invested in accordance with um, the regs, the state regs on investing. Um, but the pension assets are, are um, invested in accordance with uh, federal law. Okay, and do you know, you may not, but do you know whether the insurance regs also apply to the pension investments? Objection to the extent it calls for a legal conclusion from the witness. It appears she can't answer, but. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Do you say it appears she can't answer? I saw her shake her head, so if she's not able to answer. Okay. I was going to sustain it. <laughs> um, Ms. Green, how did, you, how did you find out well, let me ask it, ask, it, ask it this way first. Did there come a time when you found out that the, asset, the investment that lost $40 million was losing money? We were notified by the National Employee Benefits Committee that one of the assets in the National Retirement Trust had lost money and all the plans in the fund that had um, that were participating in that trust had also lost money okay. and when you were so notified what if any action did you take um, so i'm going to object on grounds of relevance and again to the extent um, this is seeking information protected by the attorney client privilege or revealing attorney client communications I'm not seeking any information protected by the attorney-client privilege or any communications between Ms. Green or her lawyers. I would note it's a very broad question, um, so I might add um, vagueness to the question, but I it's also, would also add the relevance objection as well. It's not in the least bit vague. It's directly relevant. The question is, when, they, when she found out that the, that the investment was losing money, what action did she take? Um, just to let Mr. Barber rule over. Yeah. Um, again, does this go to your, the relevancy of this in your mind, Mr. Angoff, is that fault is something the board should be considering in deciding whether or not to account for this drop in RBC or, because all these questions seem to go to, to fault, which I already explained was not relevant. Um, fault, but also the likelihood that it could happen again, which is why the process questions are so important and so relevant. If Blue Cross has processes set up and this was just a, you know, just some crazy thing that happened, then the board should have one reaction. If Blue Cross's processes that are set up are, 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 uh, defective and it's reasonably likely that something like this could happen again, then obviously the, I would think the Blue Cross is going to, the, the board would have a different reaction. Ms. Sangoff, what about that, that argument? Uh, I would just add or just reiterate um, that the points that Mr. Angoff are making about process would be exactly the types of topics that the Department of Financial Regulation um, might consider and that the Department of Financial Regulation has already issued an examination order on this issue. Um, so they are not relevant to the board's um, proceeding here, which is about, which is directed at the adequacy of the rates um, to the extent they are relevant to one of the state regulators, they fall squarely within um, the authority of DFR, which they are exercising. So the board also has authority to issue supplemental orders to ensure 
benefits and services are being provided under economical and efficient management. Does this not implicate that authority? Um, respectfully, we would say no and, and would, again, um, this is not a proceeding, I think, in which that area could really be explored. Um, and it is within the authority of Blue Cross. Uh, it is within the authority of DFR's examination order to um, to look at the, the pension assets, and that is happening. Um, and I think here the question before the board has to do with is this rate actuarially supported and otherwise um, satisfy the parameters um, for rate review. Okay, so I'm going to sustain the objection. I uh, there is a DFR investigation uh, or examination ongoing. Um, this seems to be directly related to their authority. Um, so please move on, Mr. Angle. Ms. Green, does the Blue Cross Association get to keep a percentage of the, of the assets that Blue Cross member companies invest with? So the National Retirement Trust um, has a number of fees that are charged by the people that are charged with managing the assets. So um, to the extent that those fees, um, some of them might go to the association, um, it's, it's possible. I don't know the amount. Okay. What percentage of Blue Cross's surplus went into the investment that lost $40 million? The um, accounting for pension funding has to do with the pension valuation that happens once a year. So over the many, many years of the pension being in existence, each year end, the um, fair value of the assets is compared to the projected benefit obligation and that um, surplus or, or negative amount is included in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's surplus. And that's accumulated since the inception of the pension plan. Okay. Um, so at the time that Blue Cross made the investment that lost $40 million, what percentage of Blue Cross's surplus at that time did it account for? I'm going to object to the form of the question um, because it's assuming a fact not in evidence um, and object on relevance grounds. Okay. Um, at the time, let me uh, break it up then. Ms. Green, at the time that Blue Cross made the investment that resulted in the $40 million loss, approximately what was Blue Cross's surplus? So the Blue Cross um, contributes its um, required contributions to the pension fund each year. And so to the extent that um, the assets that had the loss at the end at, during March of this year, um, I would not know when the actual um, inception of that investment was without looking into it. So I'm going to have to, sorry, interrupt your flow there. We have a board member who appears to have dropped off the call. Um, <laughs> so we're going to take a pause until we can get board member Pelham back on the line. Maybe a good time to take that five minute echo break for the afternoon. I'm back. I don't know how I got caught off, but all of a sudden you guys were gone. If Kevin needs five minutes, that's fine. No, 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 I'm good. I was just in, I didn't realize you were already back, Tom. <clears throat> Tom's back. Um, yep. Go ahead, Mr. Angle. Yeah. Uh, I believe there's a question pending which is what percentage of Blue Cross's assets at the time this investment was made did the investment account for? I believe Ms. Green answered that question. I don't believe I heard an answer. What I responded, Mr. Engoff, is the um, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont Shield makes Shield contributions Shield. to the pension fund um, over time, and I would not know um, what time frame um, that investment um, began. I don't know what the inception of that investment was. Okay. Ms. Green, could you give us a range? No. You couldn't give us a reasonable range. So it might be, a, it might be a tenth of Blue Cross's surplus? Objection. I'm not, I don't understand the question. It's vague, ambiguous, as well as relevance. 
it's completely relevant. If it's a huge percentage of their surplus, that's a very big deal. If it's a tiny percentage of their surplus, it's not so important. So I think the I think the witness stated she don't does not know. But Ms. Green, could you re restate your answer? Yes, my my answer is that Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont um, makes contributions to the pension trust each year based on minimum funding requirements. And that's the extent of what um, we do in terms of funding the pension. In terms of knowing what the date was that the investment was made or what the inception of that investment um, date is, I, I don't have knowledge of. Okay. At the time that the, uh, the investment lost $40 million, at that time, what percentage of Blue Cross's surplus was that $40 million? It's huge. It's a third. A third. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that, that's not something that we uh, we've communicated that, and th that is we've been talking about that since this morning. Okay. Um, is Blue Cross taking any action to ensure that no loss like this occurs again? So. I'm going to object to the extent that this question is calling for um, any attorney-client privileged communications or work product, um, and I'm also going to object on relevance grounds. Um, so help me understand how it calls for attorney-client or work product, as it doesn't appear to on its face. Um, because this is... Um, in, as we indicated in the written response, this is potentially a pre-litigation matter. I think the work product doctrine sweeps quite a bit broadly, more broadly than it would in other contexts. Um, and so I'm just cautioning the witness that to the extent any anything that this question treads on um, falls within the work product doctrine, um, that she should not um, reveal those privileged matters. Okay. I would also object on the grounds of relevance, which is a separate point. Um, so to relevance, Mr. Angoff, I, I assume this is going to your issue before is how does, how does, how do we know this isn't going to impact solvency in the future? Exactly right. I'll allow the question, uh, Ms. Green, please answer, but I, I, we're at three o'clock. I really do not think we're um, hitting on the issues that need to be hit on before we were scheduled to depart at four. Um, I don't think we're going to get through all the witnesses. I think this is taking up a lot of time dealing with objections, and I really wish we could move on to um, the rest of the, the hearing. So, Ms. Green, could you please answer the question? I'd like to um, just point out that the... Um the reason why these objections are important is that we are doing everything possible to protect the interests of our policyholders in terms of a possible recovery of any losses. And that's what was outlined in our response that the uh, National Employee Benefits Committee is investigating the loss. And uh, that's that's the source of a lot of the uh, inability to, to share the details, not because we don't want to share them or even that we know some of them, but it, we're trying to protect um, the eventuality of, of recouping something. Um, in terms of happening again going forward, um, like with any of our processes, we always review them and, and um, make sure that the appropriate reviews are there. The uh, National Employee Benefit Committee has uh, communicated to us what their review process is and what they'll be doing going forward. They have... Um, uh, as an example, um, are looking at the investment advisors that they've been using and um, looking at possibly changing those out. And uh, so th that is the area that we're in. Um, I will do everything in my power to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But again, um, I didn't think this was going to happen either. So uh, that's as much as I can say. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, I will take your advice and wrap this up. Ms. Green, uh, 
can you assure your policyholders that they will never pay directly or indirectly for the $40 million loss that we've been discussing? I think we talked about that, uh, or others talked about that this morning, and um, I, I'm not in a position to guarantee anything about the future at this point. Um, I, as we, I just mentioned a moment ago, we're doing everything in our power to make sure that we can um, see if we can uh, recoup some of the losses, but I, I can't make any guarantees about the future. Okay, Ms. Green, would you like to take this opportunity to apologize to your policyholders. Objection. Form of the question. Argumentative. Sustained. Do you have any other questions for this witness? No more questions, Mr. Chief. Okay, Chair. now we'll move to board members. Board member Yusufer. Um, okay, I think I'm off mute. Uh, hello, how, is, how are you doing over there? Doing okay? Um, Okay, I, I do have a few questions that also relate to the pension, but I think I'm taking it at a little bit of a different uh, different angle, which is um, I know the past policy or the policy has always been to um, take whatever the losses or gains are and, and put that through to your surplus um, account. And just a couple questions on, you know, obviously this was unexpected, massive, massive thing. We could go back and forth about why that happened, but I you know, understand where you're coming from you know, as far as um, some of the things that have happened. But I guess a couple questions would be, you know, how is the policy, how is the program funded as far as being underfunded or overfunded? You know, I know last year, just looking at the numbers, I think you had a 15 million gain on this. So it went from like 54 to 69. Obviously this year there'll be a huge, you know, reversal going the other way. But I just wonder if you're also going to look at any other way to maybe put this through to the RBC, whether that's looking at how much funding needs to be there, whether this all needs to be taken in one year. Um, I don't know if you thought about that at all. Yeah, if I can clarify, the the uh, accounting regulations require that the valuation at the end of the year will get reflected in the surplus. So um, there's there's no options around that. In terms of um, um, looking at the future uh, liability, that pension benefit liability, um, we are uh, doing a, a complete review of that in light of the circumstances, and um, that that work is just beginning. Um, and so we are looking at opportunities um, around the um, total pension liability um, for the next valuation. But once the valuation happens, the accounting regulations require us to, to put that in the financial statements and that would reflect any changes that we we arrive at through our review okay so if there were any changes to the valuation because of how much needed to be funded etc you wouldn't do that until um you wouldn't make those adjustments into the rbc until you, until that changed yeah so if i can distinguish between funding so cash funding to um, meet the federal uh, target attainment percentages, it's called FTAP. Um, those calculations are underway and are independent from the valuation that goes into the surplus um, accounting. So the, the surplus accounting at the end of the year will be a function of the fair, ass, fair value of the assets at the end of the year and the uh, fair value of the liabilities at the end of the year. And then the level of funding is a, a cash flow consideration that's required in order to um, maintain the benefit features of the pension. So um, we could choose to fund it at a 80% or choose to fund it at 100%. The, the amount that goes into surplus will be the same regardless. Okay. Um, and did the, uh, do you know, did the other blues that are participating in this plan, are they reflecting similar losses? Yes, they had uh, losses along the same degree as what we experienced percentage okay. And can you um, ballpark what 100 RBC points is equal to in a rate? 100 RBC points in a rate? Um, I'd have to pull in my chief actuary. 100 RBC basis points is 21 million. Um, 
And if we take that on the premium that uh, Mr. Pelham mentioned earlier today, if I have that handy, I think it was 300 million. I'll just use that as a, it's about seven percentage points. Okay. And, and just to be, you know, transparent, I mean, the reason I bring that up is I, I do understand that in this rate filing um, right now, this hasn't rolled through and that at this time, your RBC is still below your range. But should this 180 go through as projected, and I know there could be lawsuits, there will be lawsuits and, and you know, there will be adjustments to this, but come next year, it could be depressing the RBC by 180 basis points where there would have been a possibility that we would have been, we sh should have been at the top end of the range or exceeding that range at that point. We'll know more about COVID. A lot of things will have played out. You know, what, one thing when I look at all these, I, I say it does catch up. We, we will know what happens with COVID. And we'll know what's going to happen um, <coughs> to these things at some point in time. So we can debate a lot about what we think, but in a year or so, we'll know. And, um, you know, that, that is where it's very concerning because had we gotten up into a higher range over 700 for a period of time, it would have gone back to rate payers. And um, so I'm just going to put that out there because, you know, it, it clearly is a, a direct impact at some point. Right now, we're not there. Right now, I agree it's not in this particular filing um, because even if it were in there, you still would only be at the top of the range. But um you know, I, it's very unfortunate, but I, I do think it is relevant to the rate payers and at, and at over what time frame should they be paying for this and things like that, because um, cause it, it, it will impact. But um, just, just touching on a, a little bit about the, you, you talked a little bit about the salary increases and looking at 2021 and looking at the executive group, but can you give a perspective on what percentage the executive group's compensation, their 3% increase would make out of the total change? I don't have that off the top of my head, but it would be a reasonable percentage. On, in total, we have about 420 um, folks at the company, and I can certainly follow up with that um, detail for you. And what prevents anything from happening on those things in, in 2020? I mean, we're uh, for 2021. We're, we're only in July. Um, most companies uh, we're, we're seeing in the economy are, are struggling uh, with everything that's happened with COVID. We see hospitals furloughing people, cutting back on salaries. We see educational institutions cutting back on salaries, you know, not, a, not, a, you know, not giving an increase. Uh, we're talking cuts. We're talking everybody across the board taking cuts. And I know of a lot that have been announced in Vermont. And, you know, we're not seeing that sense of urgency from Blue Cross, um, you know, and, and we're all going to be in, every company is going to have issues with recruiting people and everything else. But, you know, I, I think it's almost a tone deaf to have the executives and everybody else in 21 continuing to get increases when this is going on. And I would want to find out what would prevent you from incorporating that now, even if it was in this rate filing a, as something different? Well, there's nothing to prevent us from considering those options. As I said in my earlier testimony that um, we are looking at all the options. Uh, we haven't concluded on anything beyond just the executive salary increase, which will be zero uh, next year. Uh, but we certainly are taking it very seriously and um, we can we can share um, further I said it was zero. Is it zero for 2022 or 2021? 2021. I'm sorry. Did I just speak for 2021? Okay. So they're going to have for 2021. And just because um, obviously if you read all the public comments too, I mean, most of the people that are purchasing these um, insurance pre are paying higher premiums and making less money. Um, you know, so it's just a little bit of a disconnect when when they're seeing, you know, everybody over at Blue Cross getting an increase or a large percentage of people and um, you're paid a little bit differently. So you're you have that flexibility to take those increases and put them into rate or you have that flexibility to not take those increases, and even if it's a small amount in rate, even if it's 0.2 or 0.3 percent in total, uh, it sends a message. 
And yeah, we also just I'd like to point out that we do have a large contingent of folks at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont that are hourly and do work do make um, you know much less than some of um, the higher paid folks. So we're we're working through what's appropriate to make sure that we're finding the right balance there because uh, there's certainly some some folks uh, in the central Vermont area that we want to make sure we're we're um, doing right by. Okay, and then when we look at um... When we look at the premium and we look at the components of the premium, medical inpatient, outpatient, and things like that, what percent of the premium, not premium increase, the total premium is related to the Vermont hospitals? What percentage? Um, that's a question I'll have to follow up on. I don't have that, have that off my head. Uh, we okay. do talk about a certain amount of the medical costs cost being. Um, the Green Mountain Care, the sorry, the Vermont hospitals, but I don't know what that would be as a percentage of the total premium. Yeah, and and the reason I'm asking that question is, you know, how do we correlate the massive shortfalls that we're seeing out of the hospitals, knowing it's across all three payers, but we're seeing their revenue down significantly across every payer because of utilization, um, knowing some of that might come back next year, but um, you know, how, how can we correlate that in what you're receiving now and what you receive next year? Um, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I, I do. I, I made a note. Well, I'll take the uh, follow-up question for the percent of premium that um, is related to the Vermont Hospital. I, I would like to just clarify uh, what I said earlier that when, when the hospitals, and I think Paul mentioned this as well on his um, question and answer is that when the hospitals absolutely are experiencing a, a drop in revenue, but that's across all of the, the Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and commercial, and then to the extent that a large portion of our book of business is uh, self-funded, the hospitals are, are experiencing that decline as well, but that is not part of our rates. So it, it's, a, it's a, important to understand the broad categories of the revenue shortage with where where that slowdown in claims is is residing at the moment. So several of the, the um, large self-funded um, um, uh, entities in Vermont are in part um, feeling um, the benefit of that slowdown in claims in the short time, short time, uh, sorry, short, short term. So that, that is when you add up the revenue shortage at the hospitals and look at um, you know, where is that coming from, um, that self-funded um, group, which is a good thing in the sense that those large employer entities are not having to um, uh, pay their health claims because they're, they're going to be deferred to later. So that, that helps them from a timing, timing point of view. So I think that would be a good thing to kind of keep, keep in the mix of of that view. Yeah, I guess in the self-funded world, they get it back now, you may have to pay it later, but in the QHP world, you guys are holding on to that. So that we could pay it later, yeah. Yeah, but you know, we, we don't know, you know, it, it's they get to make that option. But just, just looking at your pre-filed testimony um, on page seven and eight, on seven, where the statement, under the statement, what are the most significant factors related to the pandemic that, that could affect potentially affect the reserves. And then when you go to page um, eight of that exhibit 12, it says claim costs could increase due to COVID allowances given to hospitals in the form of commercial rate increases as temporary adjustments to compensate for fiscal year 2020 utilization that was not realized due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that statement seems to contradict what you said in your opening that um, you think those should be included in the rates. And so, I'm not, you know, we're not saying how we're going to affect for that yet, but we're looking at that as a COVID adjustment. You know, we're, we are looking at that as, as saying, we definitely can see that the hospitals didn't get it. We're going to have them adjust for all of their funding they receive. And then looking at commercial only, what would make them whole over a two-year period? So, so in theory, the math should be the same, in theory. Um, so I would then support that that increase shouldn't be added to any, the, the COVID only increase shouldn't be added to a Blue Cross rate because it should come out of reserves because it's related to COVID. And this statement to me supported that. I was, that's good. Um, but in your opening statement, 
you specifically said something different than what I'm interpreting here. Yeah, this, this list was uh, highlighting at, at the time we um, submitted this, this list was highlighting the risks to our reserves. Um, what I testified earlier this afternoon was that I really think based on the analysis that uh, the actuarial team has done, that we really should take a long view because um, if it is kind of a, a, a wash through 2020, 2021 and early 2022, we wouldn't want to um, you know, increase the um, cost of the healthcare system um, only to you know, have to figure out how to get that, that money back out of the system later on. So um, it was included in my pre-filed testimony as one of the risks to surplus, and it is. Okay, and, and I guess to, to counter, I guess in a perfect world, I can see what you're saying. Um, if you look deeply at the hospitals, uh, the 14 hospitals that we have, and the number that are losing money, and several of which almost ran out of money during this period prior to getting some relief, um, it may not be, and the ones that are now hitting into bank covenants, you know, they're missing bank covenants and things like that. Uh, it's probably not realistic to say that they can suffer all these losses, additional losses this year, and just wait until it comes back. If in fact it comes back, that's, that's part of the problem with the mismatch, right? Is the hospitals lost all their services. It doesn't mean they're going to come back to all those hospitals and those that didn't get COVID. So it's, um, yeah. I agree. You know, we're looking at their, yeah, but they're, they're, they're losing a lot. Of, many of them are losing a lot of money. Um, if I may, um, I'll just comment that, and I think someone mentioned this early in the testimony that um, we have um, advanced payments to hospitals who expressed some concern in those uh, April and May timeframe where they were really suffering from the lack of uh, payments from the commercial uh, book. And so we have uh, 10 million, we've advanced $10 million to facilities and independent providers to help them through the worst of those times. So I, I just add that to the perspective. It's, it's a difficult um, situation to figure out, but uh, we have been trying to help out as we can. Okay. Um, I think I'll leave the other questions to other board members. So thank you. Thanks. Hey, board member Lunge. Sorry, I have uh, one follow up to what Maureen just asked. Um, can you give us a list of those payments by hospital? We can. I don't have it here handy, but I can provide that. Great. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Board Member Pelham. <clears throat> Hello. Um, Hi. I want to uh, start. I, I only have a couple of questions, but the first one, um, looking at um, Exhibit One, page fifty-five. You don't have to go go there. I'll, I'll I'll read what it is that I think is significant. You say Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont is committed to providing insurance coverage for our members at the most affordable rates possible. As a result, even though it is impractical to react um, to enrollment shifts by immediately right sizing, we nonetheless remove from our projections the entirety of the variables associated with reduced enrollment. So I read that and then I go over to um, uh, uh, page 163 of Exhibit 1, which shows your member month uh, uh, track record from 2014 to 2019. And I see from, um, and I'm going to start at 26, 2015, from 2015 down to 2019, that's going from 768 uh, plus thousand to 520 plus uh, uh, thousand. And that's a, a, a downsizing rate of 9.3% a year over a five-year period. And so I'm just wondering, you know, in the context of that language that I read earlier, what right-sizing things um, have has Blue Cross Blue Shield done, um, you know, since 2015? Because this decline in membership um, has been at a pretty rapid rate, um, more than 9% a year. Since, since then? A couple of things, if I may, the, um, the member months that you're looking at on page 163 are, is just with respect to the, 
Vermont individual and small group business. Um, the right sizing that we referred to in the um, actuarial member memorandum talks about um, as we look at our total book of business and understand where in, uh, membership might be increasing or membership might be decreasing, we, we right size the staff um, with that full picture in mind. And um, I did look back um, and thank you for submitting your, your questions ahead of time in, in light of this question. I did look back at the enterprise level um, membership and that's uh, it's also gone down, I admit, but it's only gone down at a 2% per year um, level. And we have been able to um, uh, you know, reduce staff through attrition over time. Uh, when we formulated the 2020 budget, uh, we suspected that uh, we were losing uh, membership again. Um, and so we, we took um, several positions out of the budget to uh, make sure that we were calibrating in total. So that, that gives you a sense of how we think about the right sizing of staff. Okay, so, so let's just focus on um, individual and, and small group. I'm, you have submitted your um, a supplemental health care exhibit for 2019 that's mm -hmm. in the record here, but 2015 isn't. And um, so I went back and looked at that. And so what you have in terms of uh, covered lives uh, going from 62,853 in 2015 to 42,699 in 2019. So that again is a 9.2% average annual year drop. But what caught my eye was is that the combined premium, which would be line 1.12 on the um, supplemental, um, the uh, you would think with a decline like that, that the, you'd see some significant difference in the uh, premium amounts, claims amount, and general administration amounts. But that's not so. That the uh, the uh, uh, premium amount uh, went from 322. 8 million to 319.2 million, which is a two tenths of a, of a percent year drop. Um, the combined claims went from 292 to 292.063 to 292.984, which is an eight tenths of 1% drop. And the general administration went from 24.8 million to 24.3 million. Um, so on a premium per covered life basis, claims per covered life basis and expenses per covered life basis, all of those, uh, I mean, respectively, those are 9.8%, 10.2%, and 9.5%. And so it seems to me, you know, that, um, you know, that uh, um, uh, obviously, you know, within this, this book of business, uh, you know, the covered lives, the uh, member month, they are falling away. Um, but the expenditure amounts have stayed pretty flat. And that just uh, seems odd to me. Well, I think if, if the membership had stayed uh, level, just hypothetically, um, we do know that over the course of um, the years, there has been increases in claims, whether it's the pharmacy increases that Paul testified to earlier or other types of increases. Um, we also know that the... Um, the um, shift in membership between uh, the issuers is such that um, the cost per member for our book of business has um, grown over time. Paul indicated that it wasn't so much the case the this case year with the, the, the analysis, which is good. It means that those uh, uh, trends might be um, uh, alleviated uh, to a degree. But it is something that we take very seriously in terms of the sustainability of this book of business. Okay. Um, uh, again, on the 2019 um, supplemental, it shows 1.63 million in cost containment. Um, yes. And so what what is what do you do with that 1.6 million bucks? Yeah, so the way the supplemental health care exhibit um, works is that, as Paul indicated earlier, it's a statutory form that we fill out, and its purpose is to begin the mechanism for the, the minimum loss ratio calculation. It's not actually the basis for that calculation, but it's the beginnings of that. And one of the things that the regulators um, like us to, to parse out of our administrative costs are the costs and what we spent them on, whether it's cost containment or quality. 
um, and so on, because that makes a difference in how they calculate the MLR. So that 1.6 million is is through our cost allocations, what we believe internally um, are you know, involved in the cost containment activities. Thank you for that. Um, now I want to focus a little bit on, uh, and I'll refer you to the page, but the print's so small, you can't read it. So uh, there's no okay. sense in going okay. there. But um, unless you've got a blown up screen, it's uh, exhibit one, page 225 which is your consumer adjusted premium rates. Right. And I don't, know, I don't know if you saw it, but DIVA last year, for the last two years, they've done a very good um, presentation on the, on the um, premium cliff at 400% of, of poverty level, comparing uh, 2020, the last one I, I saw was comparing 2020 over 2019 rates. And you can see that with the Vermont premium assistance and the um, advanced premium tax credit that things are actually pretty reasonable below 400% of poverty. But, but um, when you get to above 400% of poverty, um, it's a, it's a different story. And so I'm looking at, you know, from that uh, exhibit on page 225, I just took a look at the same plan uh, that uh, DIVA used in their analysis, which was the bronze deductible plan. Um, which, um, and these are the numbers that you'll find on exhibit one, page 225. For a single person, it's $572.05. For a couple, it's $1,144.10. Mm-hmm. And for a family, it's $1,607.46. And so right at 400% of poverty, the percent of, so you're just above and, and you don't have um, any of the advantages of the subsidies, you're looking at a 13.7% rate for a single, a 20% rate for a couple, and an 18.7% rate for family. Um, and they don't; those that plan doesn't begin to get affordable by the federal standard until for a single person it's 70,000, a little over 70,000. For a couple it's 141,000, and for a family it's 198,000. And so. Um, so that is the context. To me, there is a big problem there. I'm at the lower end of that scale, just above 400 to 500 percent of poverty, those are middle class Vermonters. Um, and, and, and it is so striking that somebody at, at 410 percent of poverty can look over the shoulder at someone at 390 percent of poverty, and there's this vast, vast uh, difference. So I know that Blue Cross Blue Shield was involved in the crafting of the 2019 report on health insurance affordability merged markets to the legis- that went to the legislature. Um, it was uh, conducted by DIVA and DFR, and it cites um, Blue Cross Blue Shield as a, uh, a consulted stakeholder, who were a stakeholder. Um, and one of the recommendations, and I'll read it, of that report was, there was an array of what ways to address this, this uh, uh, premium clip, but, and some of them are pretty cheap. So I'm gonna read the cheapest one here. For additional premium subsidies, 2.2 million would be needed to lower premiums for enrollees between 400% to 500% of FPL, while 9.3 million would be needed to lower premiums 10% for all unsubsidized above 400,000 FPL. The 10% reduction translates to about, to around an $800 in savings per member per year on average. And so my, so here we have a study, it was done by Wakely, um, I'm sure reasonably actuarially sound. Um, and uh, you know, at, at the low end for $2.2 million, um, you, you could uh, lower rates for those between 400% and 500%, you know, by 10% or 800 per member. And I, you know, I don't expect this to come out of the pocket of Blue Cross Blue Shield, but I would hope that Blue Cross Blue Shield and you have some great people on the Hill, you know, would be always looking for uh, ways to advance, you know, the cause of rate holders and uh, rate payers and, and help rate payers um, achieve, for example, these subsidies. I mean, when it came around to silver loading, um, and that's when I first came on the board, there was activity like a beehive in order to uh, put that advanced premium, uh, uh, you know, tax uh, angle in place. And so, um, you know, I, I follow the state budget. It's a bad habit, I guess. Um, and I see in, in the Medicaid area, I mentioned them this morning, that 
uh, in Medicaid, they were running at 63% of the appropriation. And that's after a budget adjusted appropriation, you know, last January, um, uh, they were running at 63% when they're three quarters through the year. You have the audit of the um, uh, state auditor that found more than $2 million uh, in claims and unpaid premiums by a small sample of the those in Dr. Dinosaur. Um, and Dr. Dinosaur, um, is, you know, premium rates are lower today than they were Tom, in 2004. So Tom, my, uh, really so best for time, if you could. All right. So the question, the question is, you know, has Blue Cross Blue Shield followed up um, uh, with any of the recommendations in the in the report to lower premiums for moderate income Vermonters above 400 percent of poverty? Yes, I, it's my understanding that we were advocating for the recommendations that came out of that report. You make a good point about the cliff between um, or after 400 percent federal poverty level. And uh, we, we agree that, that that is a barrier to, to many people out there trying to afford coverage. Um, I, my understanding is that the, the barriers is you know, where will the money come from um, to the extent that there's, you have ideas, um, but we are very much um, an advocate of some of the um, recommendations that came out of that report. Well, good luck. Um, that's it, Mike. I'm through. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Member Holmes? You're on mute. Let me try and take you off. Take you off. Um, no questions. No what? No questions. Got it. <laughs> Mr. Chair, do you have questions? Unfortunately, I do. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Green. Um, good afternoon. Earlier today, um, I asked Dr. McIntosh and she referred these questions to you and the questions were, um, well, first of all, thank you for not kicking any QHP member off for their inability to pay during such a crazy time. So um, thank you to Blue Cross for that decision. But can you tell us how many uh, members are in arrears and how that compares to pre-pandemic times? maybe this, this time period last year? Sure. So um, as, you, as you mentioned in your question that at any given point in time, we often have people in arrears. Um, so one of the things that we did um, in preparation for questions, we get this question um, from others as well. And uh, so what we did is we looked at the number of customers who um, were so far into arrears that they normally would have been canceled, but then because we didn't cancel them, um, how did they sort of work their way through that and get back current or how many are still not able to get current? So that's a slightly different way of answering your question than just statistics about who's overdue. Um, hopefully you'll find it useful. So we had um, around um, 560, 559 to be precise customers as of um, the end of June, this analysis was done um, that needed some sort of flexibility of some sort across all of our book of business. For the individual and small group um, customers, there was 300, just over 300, 311. Um, and the um, that breaks down about 191 for individual and 120 for small group. The um, number of customers within that 311 that were delinquent to the point where we normally would have canceled them, but we didn't, and now they've actually been able to figure out how to get current through getting back to work or for whatever reason, um, is 173. So I, I look at that as a, a, a very specific example of how taking a situational approach to, um, you know, had we canceled those folks, they needed their coverage, it would have created a whole bunch of stress and they would have had to re-enroll anyway. So, so I think that that's a really good example of how um, sort of remaining flexible for our customers um, makes sense. 
Um, that said, though, we do have um, 100 or sorry, 69 customers as of the end of June who are still delinquent within the individual and small group book of business um, that were delinquent to the point where we normally would have to have canceled them, but we have not. So um, they still remain covered and will remain covered until something um, changes in terms of uh, the stay at home orders and the emergency order. When um, the pandemic um, was really escalating um, back a few months ago um, and um, the federal government reacted with the um, 1200 stimulus uh, checks. Um, did you see um, just the opposite effect though? People um, being afraid of, about their health care so they paid more timely? Well, it's interesting you should say that. I think in the very early stages, we were kind of bracing for the worst, um, but we did, I, and I don't know why, but we did see that people were able to um, stay current in that very, very early stage. We do have um, a number of folks in our call center who talk with people on a day-to-day -day basis if because some of our communications have said, call us if you have trip, you know, issues, we can work with you. They are. They did find a number of folks that were sort of waiting for that stimulus check or they were waiting for the unemployment to come through or there was something that they were, uh, the timing just wasn't working out for them. So um, we were saying, okay, well, just call us when you, you know, have an update and um, we'll, we'll stick with you. Did Blue Cross Blue Shield pursue paychecks protection funding? Good question. We seriously thought about it. We even um, ginned up the paperwork to get going on it. And about the time that we were getting going on it, we realized that probably um, the, the um, well, first of all, the funds were short um, the first round. And second of all, we felt like the small businesses and, um, you know, the Main Street businesses were probably um, better served to have those folks um, get that money. So we we made a strategic decision to not try and get into the second round uh, when it came around. Okay. Um, is Blue Cross seeing significant um, savings like uh, other organizations uh, around the world as far as a reduction in costs for um, travel, sending people to conferences, fewer office supplies, less occupancy costs like HVAC and electric, um, et cetera? Yeah, we, uh, I believe we answered a question and answer around that. I think it added up to around 275,000 um, as of the date that we sent that in, maybe through the end of June. The, um, you know, we have a, a very modest travel and conference budget to begin with. So yes, it is a savings, um, but it, it's small in comparison to some of the other um, um, costs and, and um, stresses that the organization or others um, at the providers and the customers are experiencing. How long is Blue Cross Blue Shield um, going to continue the policy of allowing people to work from home? Are you gonna wait till a uh, vaccine or what is your, your plan? I would really have to defer to Dr. Uh, McIntosh on that. She's in charge of kind of figuring that out, but um, based on the uh, company updates that we get regularly on this, they are, um, uh, with the back to school planning that's going on for many families, um, we're kind of plugged into trying to be as uh, flexible for folks um, while also being safe about it and recognizing the um, numbers of people in close proximity within the building, et cetera. So the, the, we call it the pandemic planning team. That team is working through um, those plans Okay. Um, you use the term executives will not receive pay increases this year. Where do you draw the line? Is middle management included in that or are you just talking C-suite? It's the uh, vice president level at the moment. That's what the decision has been made, as I mentioned uh, in response to the question earlier from uh, uh, um, uh, board member Yusufar that uh, we're, we're looking at all all different options at this point. But right now that is the uh, vice president level C-suite, if you will. Will the pay freeze eliminate any incentive pays, bonuses, et cetera? We don't know yet, but that's um, part of the analysis. Okay. How much do um, board members get paid for their role as a board member? 
board members get paid a stipend. Um, I don't know the current uh, per meeting stipend level, but um, I think it is disclosed. We can certainly get that to you. They they get paid per meeting, and if they serve on a subcommittee, they get a payment per meeting for, for that as well. Okay. Um, how often does the finance committee meet? The finance committee that you referenced when it came to investment and pension decisions. The Finance Committee meets um, on a, a standing agenda uh, three times a year, once in January, once in March, and once in October. Um, but as you can imagine, with all of the um, financial uh, topics that are uh, at issue, uh, we have been meeting much more regularly, um, at least monthly, and sometimes more, depending on the topics. Okay. And so I, I have interpreted it correctly that this one finance committee makes both the investment de decisions and the pension decisions. Now they make the investment division decisions for the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont investments. Um, they review the asset allocation for the pension, but not uh, they're not overseeing the the asset management manager selection for the pension. So we're they oversee the um, the total portfolio and look at the returns and we determine the asset allocation um, and review that once a year. So you talked about um, being in compliance with state regulations as far as your reserve investments. And you talked about ERISA being the uh, um, federal uh, governing um, law that oversees the pension. And ERISA specifically refers to um, plan trustees, plan administrators, and members of a plans investment committee. Um, help me to understand what Blue Cross Blue Shield believes is their investment committee. Is it this delegation to this national organization or is it your finance committee? So if you keep the two things separate, the pension plan as part of the National Retirement Trust, the National T Retirement Trust would have um, an investment subcommittee and uh, investment advisors for that trust. Um, that is not the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's finance committee. The Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont finance committee is the um, oversight of the reserve investments. So in, 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 if I could just, I don't know if this helps or not, but in the response that's in exhibit 22, we indicated that the form 5500s um, we shared with you for the National Retirement Trust and some of those uh, roles and responsibilities are outlined there for the National Retirement Trust. Well, I don't pretend to be an attorney, but I, I can say that in doing research for this meeting today, I could not find any ability to delegate to a national organization um, that would um, relieve you of certain responsibilities to make sure that um, um, risk is mitigated on these funds, but I'll leave it at that. Um, you prepared the July 16th, or at least you're the one who signed um, the affidavit that um, your attorney uh, submitted to board council answering questions. Um, were you also involved in conversations about the letter that was received by the board on June 26th from Don George uh, yes. regarding this matter? Yep. And were you also involved in whatever took place in March where DFR was notified? Um, I, we were meeting with DFR weekly in March or after the pandemic began in March. And so at one of um, the weekly updates I did um, provide an update that we had had a, a loss uh, in the pension fund and that we were looking into it, trying to um, find out more. So it seems like you've been intricately involved in, in this. And I'm just curious um, why you chose to wait um, 90 days before you notified the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm just going to interject and caution the witness. Um, not to disclose attorney-client communications or work product um, in any response, and and I do I do feel like I should reiterate our relevance objection here. I think Ms. Green 
well understands the line between what we've been able to um, provide information on and what, with respect to um, protecting our stakeholders, has been a concern of ours. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable Perhaps more to answer, but um, I do want to caution, I'm sorry, Chair Mullen, I do want to caution the witness on that point. Well, no. I was going to say something snide and I won't, so. But I will say this, that perhaps if Blue Cross had answered the questions that the board had put forth in their letter to Blue Cross, instead of the perfunctory response that we received back, I think Mr. Angoff was very kind when he called called it uh, telling us to go jump in the lake. My response was a little bit more um, severe than that, but I'll so, leave it at that. Um, well, hold on. The, I mean, there was a question, there was an objection to form, or sorry, there was a question, objection on relevance. Um, and I do think that the amount of time it took to notify the board is relevant. Um, there's a letter about CTR and impacts on solvency, and this was not among them. Um, so I, I would like the witness to answer the question, please. Well, the time it took us to respond is purely a function of us um, getting a full understanding of what we knew and what we didn't know and um, what the approach was going to be at the national employee benefit uh, committee level. And so the communication to the board was, um, you know, in the interest of transparency, getting that over to you. But I think it was, it was as quickly as we could have given the circumstances that we were um, looking into at the time. Well, at the very least, it, it's, a, it's a lack of courtesy to one of your regulators, but I'll leave it at that. So under the federal RISA laws, there are, there are rules for fiduciary conduct. And um, is it your belief that those rules for fiduciary conduct lie within this national association, which you chose to um, put your investments into and not with your organization itself? I'm sorry, you broke up at the beginning of that question. So I could I ask you to repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Um, there, there are rules that fiduciaries must follow under ERISA law. And um, I'm curious if you believe that um, any violations of those fiduciary responsibilities are um, to rest solely on the people at this national association, which you chose to um, lay your trust in, or does anybody at Blue Cross Blue Shield want to take any personal responsibility for this? Um, and I apologize for interjecting, um, but I think I do have to interject here um, with an objection that it's asking the witness to draw legal conclusions and um, delving into attorney client and work product matters in this area. Sustained. How many years ago was it that Blue Cross made the uh, decision to go with this national organization? It's well over 20 years ago. It's when when the pension when the pension was offered originally. The mechanism for offering that pension was through the national employee benefits uh, mechanism. And do they have to notify of you when they make uh, changes to their investment strategies? So I'm going to caution the witness, to please. Uh, they have to. We sign up for, to be part of the plan. I don't think this is an area that I think is not something that we can go into. Okay, I'll drop my line of questions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay. Do you have any redirect, Bridget? I do not. All right. I think we should talk about time since we're 15 minutes from the scheduled end of the hearing and we have four witnesses remaining. Um, what is folks availability to go beyond four? Do we need to reschedule or schedule a continued hearing in this matter? Or do you think we can get through the next couple of witnesses in a reasonable amount of time? I, I think Eleni's testimony is gonna be, I expect fairly brief. 
Um, based on Mr. Fisher's testimony last year, I'm anticipating fairly brief testimony from him, but um, how long do you think Mr. Garland um, might take I think that um, in terms of the direct, we can um, cover quite quickly with Mr. Garland and probably try to move very quickly to the executive session. Um, and it's possible if I had a couple of minutes to confer with the team, we could come up with even, an even better strategy. Um, but certainly, I think from our perspective, that testimony does not have to take very long. Um, it's even... I don't know if this would be time saving, but um, we did put the basis for going into executive session in the pre file testimony. And if the board wanted to go directly there, perhaps we it is possible that we could start there. Um, and then see if there's any questions that um, we want to cover outside of the executive session afterwards. Mr. Well, Mr. Hearing well, officer, from uh, my per perspective, I don't mind going as late as people possibly want to today, but I don't think we should go past five. And um, one suggestion would be to get to as far as we can get to today and uh, adjourn till one o'clock on Wednesday. Um, Wednesdays are normally board meeting days, so I would hope that all the board members might be available on Wednesday afternoon and that we could finish it at that time, but I don't know um, as to the parties of their availability. Well, I, uh, I'll just say for myself, staff has grabbed up my time uh, in the one o'clock range. So I'm actually, I can try to reschedule meetings that I have between one and two, but I do have a health care appointment at 315. Mr. Chair, I'm available at one on Wednesday and also Mr. Hearing Officer, if it's any help, I have no questions for Mr. Garland. All right. Uh, Why could Go maybe ahead. we don't look at, is it possible to not look for a hard stop at five, but see if we can wrap it, you know, 536. I mean, at the latest, it seems like there'd be inefficiencies to regroup if we can get through the rest in two hours, which you know, might be optimistic at how we've been going, but. I'm willing to go all night, but I'm trying to be respectful. Well, let me, is the commissioner on the line? Mike, uh, Mr. Barber, I have one other suggestion, um, if Mr. D'Onofrio agrees, which is um, since Mr. Garland is kind of a change in direction on the Blue Cross side, if it's more efficient to move through the other presentations first. That's and what then... I was thinking. Okay. Um, I'm um, amenable to anything. Commissioner Pichek, are you um, on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. What is your availability to go beyond four? Um, I had a meeting at four that I could um, let them know that I won't be able to participate in. And then uh, beyond that, I can go beyond four or other than that. Okay. I propose we, we go to the commissioner because it's kind of a continuation of the solvency discussion that we've been having um, and then move to Mr. Garland and to the extent you could cut down on the or eliminate the direct questions and we could go to the executive session and do that and board questions. Um, like I said, I don't think Helene's testimony will take much time. I could be wrong. Um, and then we can see if we can get through it as quickly as possible. Okay. Is there, is there any well, objection to that? No, nope, just at some point, we might want to take a five minute break. Yeah, why don't we take five minutes now, come back, um, hear from Commissioner Pichek, and then move on to Mr. Garland. So come Thank back you. at 3.55. Understood. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Michael, and thank you very much, Chair Mullen and the members of the Green Mountain Care Board. I think I'm going to dispense with my opening remarks as I had them prepared and drafted due to the amount of uh, time that um, I know or where the time is and the amount of time that you probably would like to spend on this testimony is probably better served answering your questions. Um, but I will just point out the high levels of our solvency opinion. You know, this year is unlike others from my, from my perspective. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic that we haven't seen uh, the likes of in 100 years. 
that uncertainty is on top of the normal uncertainty that does exist in this process, um, regardless of, uh, of that sort of external factor. Uh, you know, from our vantage point, this process is really designed to forecast or, you know, predict what the total expenses will be of the insurance company for the next year. And there's just a great deal of uncertainty with that under normal circumstances. Uh, but now we really have uh, quite extraordinary circumstances that we're dealing with at the moment um, and quite extraordinary uncertainty um, as well. You know, I think as we look up Upon and try to quantify that uncertainty that there's no doubt that what's happening across the country um, from a COVID perspective um, can and will likely impact the Northeast to some degree in the near future. We've seen cases, you know, well above 50,000 per day in terms of new infections um, on a pretty regular basis across the country. Um, you know, we, we calculate that in the last nine and a half days, last 10 or so days, that we've had more COVID positive um, infections reported than the entire state of Vermont, just to put some perspective on what's happening across the country. Uh, last week, we saw the Northeast did see its case week over week case growth increase by close to 10%. So we're not immune to this um, in the Northeast, although from a Vermont only perspective, we do remain uh, quite steady um, in terms of new cases and in terms of hospital need and things of that nature. Um, but there is still uh, great uncertainty on the longer term horizon when we look at um, how the virus will uh, grow in Vermont and in the Northeast as we uh, move into the fall of 2020. And then as it relates to this rate hearing um, into the winter of 2021, when cooler weather uh, forces us to spend uh, much of our time indoors and potentially mitigation measures have to be reconsidered and we'll see um, what happens. But I think that uncertainty is, is rather significant and will play, um, have a huge impact on what ultimately happens here uh, in rate year, plan year 2021. Talking about pre-pandemic financial position of Blue Cross Blue Shield, as we pointed out in our solvency opinion on pages two and three, um, prior to uh, any COVID impact, uh, Blue Cross did report a positive trend that its total surplus increased approximately $23 million uh, in uh, 2019 year end, and that's compared to the 2018 year end. Uh, much of that uh, surplus uh, increase, it's important to note, did come uh, from their receipt of their AMT tax credit, uh, that total just under $19 million. Uh, similarly, it's also important to point out that they did sustain an underwriting loss for the year, even though they did add to their surplus. Um, and uh, that includes an underwriting loss in the um, ACA marketplace as well. Um, and again, even though that is good news, we always like to see um, the reserves uh, going up or at least staying stable. Um, I do want to point out, as Oliver Wyman um, did their analysis, that Vermont's Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, is the lowest of its peer organizations across the country uh, as the, at the end of uh, 2019 with an RBC of about uh, 567. Uh, so among the 18 or so peer institutions across the country, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont did stand at the lowest uh, RBC level. Um, all that being said, there's obviously now uh, that we're into 2020, there's obviously been a significant impact uh, from COVID-19, um, how these sort of major unknowns play out, in my opinion, will determine whether um, whether the rates were sufficient for this current year. And then it will also determine what impact that will have on Blue Cross Blue Shield into 2021 uh, and beyond. Uh, no doubt that the biggest unknown and how this unknown is resolved will have the biggest impact, in my opinion is the reduction um, and then also the potential return of medical claims, so medical procedures. Um, certainly, uh, medical claims have been down uh, pretty significantly for March, April, May, and we did see uh, somewhat of a return to normal in June. Um, so we will wait and see how that return to normal plays out. Will that be something that's constant throughout the summer? Is that something that will um, roll back once uh, the fall comes around and potentially increase cases of, of COVID are back on the rise in the Northeast and potentially in Vermont as well. You know, there are a lot of unknowns in, 
in the trajectory of the virus, and therefore there's a lot of unknowns in the trajectory of the financial position of our health insurers. Um, we also point out uh, certainly that Blue Cross Blue Shield will also have a direct um, cost of treating COVID-19 uh, patients. We've um, leaned on them from a department standpoint to implement policies that we think are good health policies. So for example, zero cost uh, share on testing, zero cost share on treatment for COVID-19. Um, we think that was morally the right thing to do, but also was the right thing to do as it relates to getting ahead of the health crisis that we're facing, making sure there were no barriers uh, to people getting a diagnosis and for people getting treatment uh, so that we can uh, curb the spread of the virus. But those do come obviously with costs and, and Blue Cross is um, uh, bearing those costs directly. Also, uh, it has to uh, be said, although not part of um, the 2020 or 2021 rates, uh, that the extent uh, of the pension valuation, that issue, uh, will certainly determine in the long run um, the solvency position of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, we point that out in our solvency opinion. Um, just to, just to uh, proactively say a few things about that, since I'm sure there'll be some questions. You know, our, our stance is that uh, the, the, the pension was well-funded coming into um, this particular event. That is certainly a positive thing. Um, also, we'll just say that, uh, you know, what was uh, the remainder of the cash assets were able to be reinvested at a low point in the market, and the market has returned quite steadily um, over the spring. So I think that has to be taken into account um, as uh, we look at the, the full year and not just the particular event that occurred. Um, and then, of course, as has been alluded to during the hearing, the legal recourse, which I won't get into much detail on. Uh, but that's also something um, that will play out in that legal recourse and its ultimate, um, uh, you know, success or result uh, will ultimately determine what the true impact is here. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there are a lot of factors that have to be borne out before we really know um, what impact that, that pension uh, issue will have on the longer term impact of Blue Cross Blue Shield. We also pointed out point out in our solvency opinion that there are a number of other smaller uh, items that uh, either will benefit uh, or potentially be a detriment to Blue Cross in the shorter and longer term. There's some ongoing litigation relating to um, uh, uh, cost sharing reductions, uh, referring to risk corridor payments that have a likelihood of success and there are likely recoupments of money there. Uh, I think the board is aware of this, but um, the ATM tax credit under the CARES Act was basically uh, fast forwarded uh, so that the total payments will be paid out uh, in the current year. Uh, so that's money that we all were well aware of, but it is money that will be uh, more quickly available uh, to Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then, of course, there are some, some things that, uh, again, will have an impact, the significance of which um, we'll wait to see. But there are certain things under the CARES Act that Blue Cross Blue Shield and other health insurers will be responsible for, like the payment, like the payment of uh, vaccines, for example, when uh, when they are available, um, and I think as already has been touched on, there are some other questions about the extent to which uncollected premiums from uh, individuals or businesses that are having flexibility, to what extent those uh, are able to be paid back um, in the short and long term, um, and potentially the the impact of any provider assistance that's been um, been uh, allowed by Blue Cross Blue Shield as well to the extent to which those um, advances are or are not paid back is some degree of uncertainty also. But I think without a doubt, the greatest uncertainty is those direct uh, related COVID uh, items that we uh, that I touched upon uh, in testimony today, but also in our solvency opinion as well. So with that, I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions that um, anyone might have. Okay, Mr. D'Onofrio, are you doing questioning for the commissioner? No, thank you, Mr. Barber. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner Pichak. No questions. Okay, Mr. Enga. Yeah, just a few questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Commissioner. Hello, sir. Nice to see you. Sorry we can't be in person. I'm equally sorry. Um, what, if any, authority does the department have over the types of investments uh, an insurer or, a, or, or Blue Cross would make? Generally? Yeah. 
So generally, obviously, we're very uh, interested and concerned with um, the types of investments insurance companies, as you know, um, make their um, revenues either through underwriting uh, or through investment returns. And both of them are equally important to the long term sustainability of a company. So putting underwriting to the side, when we're talking about investments, um, we have obviously a great interest in that. Um, we have statutes that talk about diversification and talk about the extent to which assets can be invested in certain asset classes as well. Um, and then uh, we have uh, examinations that we do at the department to determine whether investment policies that have been set by the company separate from that statutory uh, regime that I mentioned are being adhered to as well. Um, but I will point out that um, what I just described applies to what are known as admitted assets. So those are assets that the company has at its disposal to liquidate and pay claims for, um, for its members. Um, what we don't um, have the same authority statutorily or otherwise over are non-admitted assets that are the type of assets that would be in a pension trust. Those are um, governed by ERISA, which I think everyone knows is a federal uh, regulatory regime and also somewhat complicated regulatory regime. Uh, but those would be considered non-admitted assets that wouldn't be subject to our statutory requirements um, or necessarily to, um, you know, those types of uh, uh, investment policies that the reserve uh, assets and, and uh, the ass and the reserves that are invested would be subject to. Okay, so the uh, the investment that we've dis been discussing much of the afternoon is something that your department has no authority over. Well, again, I think the uh, the assets are uh, not subject to the statutes that we just referred to, uh, whether or not any decisions leading up to or whether or not um, uh, the assets themselves and how they were invested um, is a matter of our authority. I won't get into that, but it's not subject to the statutory regime uh, that reserve uh, reserve requirements are subject to. Okay, so Blue Cross certainly didn't have to get your prior approval before making the investment that lost $40 million. Uh, no. Okay, and did Blue Cross have any duty to disclose that investment to you at any time? So as a, as a primary regulator and, and certainly primary solvency regulator, um, we certainly would anticipate an event of this magnitude uh, being disclosed to us. And it was promptly disclosed uh, to myself um, and uh, to our team more broadly uh, in late March. Okay. Um, and based on that disclosure, was there any action that you took? Yeah, so... Um, as I think it has been alluded to earlier, we have set up weekly standing financial calls with Blue Cross since the start of the pandemic. Um, that is sort of, um, you know, our staff at the departments that are experts with the with the experts at Blue Cross Blue Shield talking to each other. Um, so uh, not only did um, I, not only was I interested in learning more about the loss, but so were those experts, and they got information on an ongoing basis from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, it was certainly an evolving situation, I'll call it that, where information was learned over time. Um, and uh, we certainly wanted to be of assistance any way that we could during that period. Uh, but ultimately, we wanted to um, understand the full scope and extent of the loss and the decision making. Um, ultimately, I think it's been alluded to in this hearing, uh, we believe in sort of a posture of uh, trust but verify, and ultimately at the end of the day, we decided to open up a targeted examination to look at this issue in greater depth. Um, and uh, I'll just point out that we had a regularly scheduled examination that was set to kick off at the end of the year uh, in December uh, 2020, January 2021. That's a five-year exam cycle, but we decided to uh, move more quickly uh, considering um, the scope of the issue. And when you say exam, you mean a financial exam? So it's a targeted exam looking specifically at um, the pension issue. Um, it has a very broad um, uh, range of questions and of, and of interest, some of which are financial, some of which are more um, corporate governance related. But um, it, is a, it is a broad exam that looks at the issue holistically. Okay. 
And if the, as you said, the department uh, doesn't have uh, th th doesn't have authority to regulate those the type of investment we're talking about, right? The investment that lost forty million dollars. That the, the department is not th that investment is not subject to the department's uh, statutes. That is correct. I mean, there's ERISA statutes and there are, are, are uh, there's a lot of case law and there's a lot of ERISA policies that talk about uh, investments and, and what type of investments are appropriate. I will say where we do have an interest in this, obviously, is to the extent to which, you know, a, a trust or a trust fund uh -huh. might have a negative impact on Blue Cross Blue Shield because there are um, there are requirements, financial requirements that that trust uh, has to make to pensioners and, and to the extent to which Blue Cross Blue Shield has to contribute monies to that pension. So there is an interest for us and for all of us, um, but we don't have, um, you know, primary regulatory oversight over those, um, over those, how those investments uh, are, you know, are invested and, and what the policies are around them. Does the department have any remedial authority in connection with the pension investment if it finds something uh, in the course of its targeted examination that it's uh, troubled by? Yeah, I think we always have, you know, we have great authority both in the insurance um, arena. Um, and also, I'll just point out that we're also a securities regulator as well. So if there's um, concern um, from that perspective, that's something that we have great interest in too. Okay. And so what would the department's remedial authority consist of? You know, they have recommendations, um, uh, directives, um, whether or not um, uh, the current corporate governance structure is appropriate, whether it should be reconsidered, uh, whether um, investment decisions should be made um, within the Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, you know, uh, family, or whether it is appropriate to continue to delegate those. I think those would be the types of issues and questions that we would be talking about here. Um, where Blue Cross Blue Shield, as everybody knows, is not a for-profit company. Um, it has no shareholders. It has no uh, earnings. Uh, has no dividends. Things of that nature. You know, um, there's certainly penalties and things of that type are always available to any insurance company. But um, in the case of, of one that is not a is not motivated by profit and one that um, is funded by Vermonters you know, that um, is not necessarily a, a course that we go down very frequently. But all of those things are available to us. Okay, just one or two more questions, Mr. Commissioner. Um, can you tell the board what this investment that experienced the $40 million loss was? Can you describe the investment? Yeah, so I don't know what is um, necessarily public and what is private, but I will, I will at a very broad level describe um, what the strategy was, and anyone feel free to cut me off if I'm uh, going into territory that uh, I should not be going into, but I believe this is all public information. Um, so the investment um, is something known as a derivative-based uh, investment, so there are uh, opportunities to um, uh, leverage uh, your investment. There are also opportunities to um, leverage it on the negative side so that you can limit the amount of losses that you might experience in a market downturn. I think we all know that the market downturn in February, March of this year was significant and was volatile to a point that I think it's fair to say we've never seen before. We had we had single day highs and single day lows repeatedly being uh, met, um, you know, within a two or three week period. So all assets and all strategies were under significant pressure. Um, and some did not perform as well as others, obviously. So is it fair to say that the value of this investment depended to a large extent on the volatility of the stock market? So just to be clear, the volatility was something that was, um, was anticipated to be avoided due to the strategy. I think it's safe to say that um, that volatility should not have impacted the assets to an, to an extent um, that one would suspect that was a, it was an attempt to protect from downside risk. Um, and does the department have any regulations or bulletins or informal practices that would 
limit the percentage of Blue Cross's surplus that could be in any one particular investment. Yeah, of course. So, so, so what we just talked about were, were those statutory, that statutory regime that exists, um, right? So, but I want to make one point clear that um, the assets and the reserves that Blue Cross Blue Shield has, those are within the corporate entity of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, these um, pension assets are under the pension trust and they're separate. So they're not part of Blue Cross Blue Shield's reserves um, or surplus. They're separate and outside of that reserve calculation. I talked earlier about how reserves had gone up about 23 million. I think they stand at something like 130 million at the end of the year. Those that is not impacted by what we're talking about now. Um, the loss is outside of that statutory um, surplus or reserve number. So as it relates to that number, though, um, we certainly have limitations as to the type of assets and how the type of assets and how much of those assets can be invested in uh, based on the quality of the asset. Um, if the pension assets are outside of the surplus calculation, why does the loss of $40 million reduce RBC? By 180 points, because it's still a loss to the corporate, to the global sort of structure of Blue Cross Blue Shield, but not part of their reserves that are set aside to pay uh, rate holder, you know, medical needs. Okay, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I have no further questions. Hey, Maureen. Uh, thanks. And Mike. Hi. Um, just a couple questions. When when we look at um, the schedule, Exhibit 12, page 37, which is kind of pro forma in where the RBC could potentially go. And the question I have is if the pension valuation was taken out of these numbers, um, right now in May, they're at 695. That doesn't include the pension. And at year end prior to COVID, we would have been about 733 potentially. And so finally, in kind of the higher end of the range, you know, where we would have been out of being near the bottom. But I guess at what point would you intervene to talk about um, giving back some, you know, Certainly, 733 isn't over the range yet. But when when would you have come in and potentially said, you know, you know, we don't need to be this high? Yeah. So 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 good question, and I, I'll answer it two different ways. One um, one if they were over if they were over Blue Cross Blue Shield was over its its upper level threshold, and we were about to engage in the 2022 rate process. You know, we we might have an opinion in our solvency review that is different than we have in the past where we say, you know, based on based on the, the current solvency and and based on, um, you know, the need, you know, there, there is, you know, there is potential to lower the rate or to have the rate not be as high as being requested, even though it might be actuarially justified because they're outside of their range. So that would certainly be one possibility. Um, the other that I think is something that that is um, that we that every that we need to consider is when you look at other lines of insurance, whether it's auto or homeowners or workers comp or commercial, you know, there's some degree of re reduction that's happened across the board. People are driving less, people are not in their workplaces, even if they're working, um, you know, whatever the, whatever the impact might be that people have paid for a premium and under a certain risk calculation and that risk, risk calculation changed dramatically during 2020 and, and due to the, due to the uh, pandemic. So if, 2020 is over and it is clear at some point in 2021 uh, that, you know, as we put in our solvency opinion, colloquially, did Vermonters overpay in 2020 for their health insurance? Um, if that question can be answered definitively, which I don't think it probably can until, you know, April or May of next year, in all honesty, when we have a sense of what does 2020 look like and then what does the rest of 2021 look like as well? You know, what's the extent of the deferred care? Um, then there's an opportunity to talk about, you know, potentially, um, you know, premium refunds or premium credits like we have with other 
types of insurance companies during the pandemic. We've we've had about $25 million of premium credits or refunds provided to Vermonters during the pandemic to date from, you know, from dental insurance to auto insurance to all of those things. But uh, I'll just point out that those are those are events, those are types of insurance where you know the event isn't going to occur in the future. We know there's not deferred um, uh, automobile accidents, for example. Those either have happened or they're not going to happen. Um, but with healthcare, it's a little bit different. So you need a little bit more time to see how things play out before there's certainty as to, you know, was the pricing right or was it significantly off to a point where, um, you know, premium credit should be considered. So I think either in the rate process or even in that premium credit discussion, um, I think that I think both of those are appropriate, um, uh, whether or not they Blue Cross Blue Shield hits the top of the range or whether or not uh, they're within their range. And, and, and credits, for example, should be something that's that's considered as well. And I, I agree with you that, you know, eventually this will catch up. I mean, we can all debate, should we give COVID money back now or should we wait? But um, I guess a concern would be that let's say that it, it does generate favorability and we see that as we get into to 21 and beyond. But if this 180 sticks on, on from the pension, you know, it's going to pull them down to the lower range. Um, and, 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 you know, they benefited basically because we got back all the AMT tax credits and we got, we got accelerated, you know, all these things happened that we knew would improved their RBC. It seems like there might be a dilemma then if um, if the COVID piece generates, I'm going to make up a number, you know, 50 to 100 basis points and the RBC gets hit by 180 because of the pension plan. And then they're kind of in the lower end of that range. And, um, you know, I know it's hypothetical, but where do you think you're going to come out at that point if we know COVID clearly should have been given back? There was a benefit that should have been given back to the ratepayers. Yeah. Um, yet now the RBC is, you know, depressed by what currently, you know, would be almost a third of their RBC gone because of the pension issue. So I think I think it's fair to. Um, it, so I would consider that like a potentially a worst case outcome in terms of the, the pension matter, right? So, and, and that's a fair, it's fair to consider that. Um, it's fair to consider that. And I think at the end of the day, um, the solvency component, the solvency piece is, is that if, if they are, if they, the company, um, sort of are at the lower end of their range for the good of their members, you know, you want them to have, you want them to have that buffer and, and that amount of financial capacity in the event you know, something else uncertain happens in, in 2021 or 2022. Um, but I will say that, you know, I don't know how likely that outcome is. First, of, you know, first of all, as I mentioned regarding the pension assets, so once the once the assets were liquidated and turned into cash, they were reinvested into a down market where the market was coming back up. So just even that factor, you know, how does the market end the rest of the year will have uh, potentially an impact of lowering that that loss. Um, and then to what degree is litigation successful in returning anything to, um, to the, to the, uh, the trust fund, uh, you know, the pension fund? Um, you know, I think we'll have to wait and see on, on that, obviously. But, you know, that's another possibility of, of money coming back in to, to, to um, fill the gap. So uh, I guess I just want to, you know, it's sort of a long-term vision that you have to have on, on this issue right now, I think, because of the uncertainty with the virus. And then the uncertainty with issues like this pension issue as well. Right. And I mean, you know, one thing we do know, though, is if you have an investment and it goes down 50 percent in order to get back to the same place right. to go up 100. So I agree the market's going up, but, you know, we're going up on on a lower yeah. lower base. So exactly be- right. You couldn't have, you couldn't have said it better. Um, and um, it will be mitigated, but it won't be, you know, won't yeah. be. Um, OK, thank you. That's all I have. All right, Member Lunge. Um, I'm actually fine. I don't have any questions. Thanks. Okay, hey, Member Pelham. <clears throat> My only sense uh, question would be is what's your sense about when both of these COVID and pension will be coming in for a landing? Yeah, so with, with COVID, you know, I think it's it's fair 
you know, at the end of the day, what's going to change everything is is a widely available vaccine. I think I think everyone um, is aware that that um, we're probably not going to get to what's known as herd immunity just by, you know, rolling racking up infections among people in the United States or worldwide or in Vermont. The the disease prevalence among the population is so low. You know, maybe in Vermont there's a study that came out that said maybe two percent of Vermonters had the virus, and you need closer to 60 or 70 percent to get herd immunity. So I think most people think that's not realistic, and it's also unknown how long that immunity will last from contracting the virus, which gives people real pause for that from that perspective. So it really comes down to the vaccine, and until the vaccine's available, I think we're going to be living with with COVID. So that means this fall we'll be living with COVID. Likely in the winter we will be as well, and, and sometime in the spring things will likely change, knock on wood, if the vaccine development continues as it is. But there's a there's optimism that in late 2020 and early 2021 there will be a vaccine that's approved. Um, but then the question is, how do you distribute it and how do you scale it up so that there's enough available for everyone in the United States to get the amounts that they need. And that's a process that will take some time. So even if in early 2021 we have the vaccine, let's build in another six months until it's widely distributed. And and that's just one, you know, that's just one possible path forward. You know, something could happen more quickly, something could could happen longer, but I think that's that's a viewpoint is we'll be dealing with it into 2021 is, is a reasonable estimate. In terms of the pension issue, same same timeline almost to some degree. I mean, you know, we'll have a sense by the end of um, this year, sometime in March, what, what the investment returns were for the year. Um, and then, uh, but then the other question of the legal issue is, you know, the pandemic might be more certain than, than a legal process, which has a great deal of uncertainty or legal recourse, I'll put it that way. Okay, board member Holmes. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, a, a couple questions for you. Uh, what are the legal limitations on how CTR may be used? Is there some percentage or dollar value that must be retained for unexpected medical losses? Or, you know, what kind of guidelines are there around CTR usage? For the contribution to reserves? Yeah, sorry. And you mean the um, amount that's asked for? No, I mean in terms of how you regulate it. So, you know, we've heard about um, asset allocations and, um, you know, say, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield wanted to build a new building, right? New Build a new office building, and they wanted to draw down from reserves to do that. Is that something that you would uh, be regulating on your end, the usage of reserves oh, for non-medical expenses? And are there limitations on that? And is there a minimum amount that you want to keep in there? for unexpected medical losses. How does that work? I'm yeah, sure. so so the so the contribution to reserve is just a, is something built in every year that is like oh, an additional sorry, amount. I, reserve. I mean, right. res sorry, the yeah, total reserve, sorry. The total reserve, so that's something where we obviously want to have um, a close eye on. So if you, regardless if it was medical or non-medical related because it's depleting the amount of reserves that's available to cover, um, to cover um, you know, medical claims. So if, it, if it's an investment, um, Blue Cross has made a few investments in the last year that they think will either benefit their members from a, an ultimate, you know, cost perspective to make prescription drugs less expensive, for example, or it'll benefit the company because it's moving into a new line of insurance like Medicare uh, Advantage. Or Medi uh, so, so there there are opportunities to make those investments, and when they're wise and prudent, you know, those are those are things that um, we uh, will support. Um, when it's, you know, if it's something that is less likely to result in some benefit or savings to members, it's probably something we'll look at more skeptically. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're obviously very interested in how member reserves are used and spent and, and even invested, obviously, as well. Okay. Sorry. It's a little bit late. It's like, what, an eight-hour Zoom call, so I apologize. I <laughs> Use of CTR versus reserves, but I meant reserves. But you answered the question. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you talked a little bit about um, insurance rebates and the different types of insurance, you know, auto insurance being different than health insurance. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about why dental is different than medical, knowing, you know, DFR had approved premium, you know, uh, relief for dental insurance. 
Yeah, for sure. Happy to. So um, dental emergencies were still available during the pandemic, you know, if you had a dental emergency. But I think the great the great um, the great percentage of, of usage is more towards someone's annual cleaning and and sort of those routine procedures that were suspended. So in all likelihood, if someone has missed, you know, during that window, their routine procedure, they're not going to be able to get back into the dentist's office until their next you know, six month or year checkup. So there is more, there is a little bit more certainty in that dental space than, um, than in health insurance where, you know, we could get, you know, it's, you could always do, have a dental emergency. I don't mean to suggest you can't, but I think there's, there's a greater likelihood that you'll need medical care, um, you know, either on a emergency basis or just on a more routine basis more frequently. And that's harder to predict uh, than in a dental area. Do you know what percentage of, of dental claims are routine versus emergent? I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I do know, I do think there's a significant amount that, that fall into that sort of preventative routine bucket. Okay. Um, and my last question revolves around, um, Ms. Green testified a little bit earlier this afternoon that um, the March bulletin that you, DFR put out, um, as a result of that bulletin, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield felt the need to suspend their cost containment and their fraud, waste, and abuse programs in order not to um, burden providers during the pandemic. Um, and so I'm wondering from your perspective whether with COVID cases now, you know, in the single digits and utilization, we're hearing up over 100% in many instances, whether there's any plan from DFR's perspective to update the bulletin to allow carriers to reinstate cost containment, fraud, waste, and abuse programs. Um, just to put into perspective, the fraud, waste, and abuse program, it looks like to me from the testimony we've seen, and actually it's on exhibit six, page 59, the suspension of that program alone as a result of that bulletin is um, will increase claims about four million dollars above projections and has a 20 basis point impact on RBC. And it sounds like from testimony from uh, Mr. Schultz that it would also has a, you know, if they were able to reinstate or go back to the full uh, fraud, waste and abuse program, there might be a reduction in premium of about half a percent. So. This bulletin actually is having a significant impact, you know, potentially on premiums and on RBC. So I'm wondering if there, you know, what your future outlook is for allowing insurance companies to regain, you know, reduce that, uh, those programs. Yeah, for sure. It's a great question. And, and I haven't reviewed that bulletin since March. So excuse me if I have this not exactly correct, but I do believe that there was a distinction between routine audits and those audits that, um, were designed to un that there's a sort of an emergent fraudulent issue that's happening or some sort of waste and abuse that's currently ongoing that um, there is an attempt to get to the bottom of. But I, I imagine that many of those routine audits are what ends up turning up fraud, waste and abuse as well. So um, I just want to make that distinction. But absolutely, 100%, you're right. I mean, um, we will reconsider that. Um, we, we did it in March to um, alleviate the pressure on providers who were transitioning to telemedicine who, you know, we, we didn't want to have them um, be interrupted in treating COVID related items. But as you all, as everybody knows, um, now we're in a very different position and the extent to which all of those providers were called on to treat COVID patients was different. Some had a very different experience than others in terms of their workload and capacity. So I think that 100% is something that um, we will consider and we'll do it in the short term. Very short term, like in the next couple of weeks as we're deciding rates. Our short term is days, not weeks. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner Pichuk. Hey, Chair Mullen, how are you? Oh, hanging in there. It's been a long day. Um, plan fiduciaries include uh, plan trustees, plan administrators, and members of a plans investment committee. Um, you're, you're a specialist in financial law. Um, under this scenario that uh, has been laid out before us, it seems like everything has been delegated to this 
um, National Retirement Trust. Um, under this scenario, who do you think those three entities are that have the fiduciary responsibility? Yeah, so there isn't, uh, well, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, we have a targeted exam underway. We're trying to get uh, some exact, we're trying to get 100% confidence and certainty ourselves. So I don't want to go too much into the details, but I will say this, you know, there there is an investment advisor that's that's as part of this entity. Investment advisors generally owe fiduciary duties to um, their clients. So that would be likely the trust, depending on the exact relationship. And the trust obviously owns owes a fiduciary duty um, to the members of the trust as well. So those are the two entities that strike me as owing a fiduciary duty, that investment advisor and um, the trust itself. If, if you or your staff at DFR received a phone call um, from a 60-year-old um, Vermonter at Blue Cross Blue Shield who um, has concerns about um, what has happened with their pension, um, it doesn't even have to be this set of facts. It could be a totally different set of facts where um, they believe that um, there was some um, interchange of funds between a related organization or something. Um, who do you refer that caller to since you're not the enforcer? Yeah, so we often do. We often get calls just like that, in all honesty. Um, people have questions about their 401k uh, or potentially a pension fund as well. And we usually send them to Vermont DOL. Um, and Vermont DOL has better contacts with um, national, uh, you know, the federal DOL. But ultimately, it's the federal DOL that's the regulator of ERISA plans. So it's, it's labor that would have that responsibility. And um, would they just have criminal enforcement or is there also possible civil enforcement? So my understanding is that, that ERISA is, would be enforced from the federal DOL from a civil standpoint. If there was a criminal matter, it'd be referred to the uh, Justice Department, I believe. So I think federal DOL has civil enforcement authority. Okay. And so um, clearly ERISA um, rules um, for fiduciary conduct um, say that um, all fiduciaries may be personally liable to restore any losses to the plan and that courts may take whatever action is appropriate against fiduciaries who break their duties under ERISA, including their removal. Given that, um, is there a strong basis for recovery from some of these entities that you have discussed that you believe would be um, possibly the um, trustees or administrators? So um, I was waiting for someone to cut me off to answer that question, but I don't see hear anybody doing it. So I'll just at the high level, just say that um, there are a, a number of people in that chain that, um, you know, have some have some explaining to do, including the ultimate product as well, not just the fiduciaries, but the ultimate product in which which did not perform as you know expected. So, um, you know, how you, I don't want to I don't want to get into the range of success, but um, you know there is a there is a there is a reason for the process. I'll just put it that way, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, going back to March and the weekly meetings that you talked about um, between DFR and Blue Cross Blue Shield, was there ever any discussion uh, about whether or not the Green Mountain Care Board should be alerted? So I can't speak to the, the weekly meetings because they were, I don't, that, that's with our expert staff and Blue Cross Blue Shield's expert staff, but I did have a conversation with with um, Don George initially about this, and we didn't. We just we didn't discuss that. Okay. Um, there's there's been a lot of uh, hyperbole in the media about uh, whether or not uh, um, Vermonters are entitled to a decrease rather than a rate increase, and um, I'm curious if. Green Mountain Care Board said you're not getting any increase. Um, wouldn't that be in violation of uh, promoting insurer solvency under our duties under the statute? 
Yeah, so as, as you know, Chair Mullen, that you you have the unenviable task of balancing those two those two um, you know somewhat ir irreconcilable you know goals of affordability and insurer solvency and um, you know certainly we laid out in our solvency opinion the impact that various rate cuts would would have to the insurer solvency. So I think those obviously need to be uh, greatly considered and and done so with um, great caution. You know, as we've said in the past, we we think a um, an unjustified or a non actuarially unjustified non actuarially justified deviation from the rate, you know, um, would be uh, would have an impact on insurer solvency in the long term. And we still have that opinion. Uh, so so I think that's that's something you have to balance. But um, you know. Affordability is one of the criteria that the board has to consider, and we certainly acknowledge that. So this will probably be a topic for another day, but just to uh, make sure that you know that a high-ranking member of the same administration that you're a member of has repeatedly said to the media uh, that they believe that there shouldn't be a rate increase as well. So um, I just wish that everybody would talk with each other. That's just a wish. You don't have to answer anything there. Well, the, the only the only item I'll point out there is we do have a, at the department, you know, we do have a statutory responsibility that's that's certainly different from our, our potential, potentially our own personal beliefs or personal beliefs of others within the administration. But we have to execute on that that sort of statutory um, responsibility that we've been doing. If you were a member of the uh, Green Mountain Care Board and you had the uh, statutory requirement of making sure that it promotes insurer solvency. Um, was there anything in the questions that we asked Blue Cross Blue Shield that you think crossed the line? I didn't hear, I didn't participate in the full day's uh, hearing, but from what I heard, I, I did not hear anything that crossed the line. No, I, I'm referring specifically to the questions that I know you were copied on. We had a conversation. Oh, 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 oh I see what you're saying. Sorry, I got it. I understand now. Sorry. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way: We, you know, when we do our examination, it's it's done in a it's done in a, a confidential process. It's not in a public process. So that's one. That's definitely one. Um, that's one. That's basically the only difference I would see between. Uh, I wouldn't see your inquiries and and the things that we're interested in as differing substantively. I would only view them different procedurally. That this is a, a confidential process that we have the luxury of understanding um, and doing our due diligence and then it results in something that we can or cannot make public where this is just a public process and it's difficult to have that kind of you know deep due diligence in this in this environment well i think there are capabilities to go into executive sessions and for requests for confidentiality that would have to go through our our council but um, i think that we too could have kept something confidential but instead we were just uh, denied the information, um, but that's a whole nother issue. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Yeah, of course. Okay, I think we'll move on to the, Mr. Garland. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, thank you very much. So Bridget or Mike, um, Have you given any more thought to just going straight to executive session to talk about confidential matters? You're on mute. Bridget, you're on mute. I hope that wasn't me having that same mute problem. Okay. Um, I would, yes, we're fine going straight to executive session. I was just going to point um, uh, you and the board to page six of exhibit 14 in which we laid the foundation for going to executive session. Um, if that's sufficient for the board to take that action, then we can um, move directly there. If you want me to elicit that testimony on the record, I will. Remind me what page it's on. Sir, it's page six of exhibit 14, the last question. So, board members. Um, Do you need a motion? 
Yeah, but I think we should talk about the bases first because I think there are two distinct bases. Um, one uh, relates to what is in um, Exhibit 14, page 6, which speaks to kind of the... Um, so let me back up. So there's, under the Open Meetings Act, the board can go into executive session to consider contracts, but only after making a finding that premature public knowledge would place a person at a substantial disadvantage. There is also um, an exception to the Open Meetings Act, or not exception, sorry, provision that allows you to go into executive session to uh, discuss uh, confidential documents, and I believe some of you may have questions uh, regarding exhibits or materials within exhibits that have been determined to be confidential and that we have a duty to protect conf confidentiality of under our rule. So, um, so I think that those two separate bases are important because you, you would need to find, if you wanted to talk about contract negotiations but not specific to a confidential document in the binder um, that there that premature public knowledge would place Blue Cross at a substantial disadvantage and that's what this uh, pre-filed testimony speaks to I believe um, and we need to be clear about the bases you need to be clear about the bases uh, for going into executive session so um, with that said would anyone like to move um, to find that public knowledge of the details of Blue Cross's provider contract negotiations would place Blue Cross at a substantial disadvantage. I would like to move that. Okay. Any I'll discussion? Second. Oh, sorry. I'm not, that is up on the procedural process. Um, any discussion? Okay, would all those in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then I think the next step would be, would anyone like to make a motion to go into executive session to take testimony about the details of contract negotiations between Blue Cross Blue Shield and healthcare providers and about confidential materials in the exhibits? Yes, I would like to move that we go into executive session on those bases. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please signify aye by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so. Mr. Farber, if I, I might interject, and maybe you were going there, we might need, do you need to swear the witness in on the record? I don't know the answer to that, but we should probably do it anyway, just in case. <laughs> Mr. Garland, yeah, it looks like Mr. Garland is unmuted. Uh, let me find Mr. Garland so I can pin him and see. I don't think he has his video on. He does. He's, oh, he does? Okay. Well, I, I can't pin him, but. He might have too many people pinned. I had to take they some have to unpend people to pen new ones. Mr. Garland, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, so there's a couple matters we need to wrap up before we go into executive session. The first is um, who needs to be in the executive session? Uh, I think obviously the board members, the board's rate review staff, the HCA's attorneys, the carrier's attorneys, obviously the witness and the court reporter. Is there any one else who is necessary to this executive session? I think uh, Lucas would like to have some of its um, staff in the executive session. Mike, is that what you were going to address? Exactly. Okay. Um, 
Sonny, is it possible to have this section of the hearing transcribed separately? Yes, um, I need a minute to open a new file, and I guess we are going to leave this and follow a different link as well. So I just need a minute to get that all done, but certainly I can come. Um, I think we owe people who are not going to be able to come uh, an estimate of how long we will be. Um, All right, I'm just looking at a text. Um, any estimates? I'm more board members. <laughs> Lots of questions, a few questions, general sense. Tom? Here are three questions, roughly. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I am, two or three questions. I think I have four questions. Some of them may overlap with Jess's, though, so that may. This, I'm guessing we are. We might have a mind meld going on. All right. By the time those guys are done, I probably won't have any questions. Put them first. Okay. No questions. <laughs> All right. So the, the, the two best words in the English language. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I think 540 would probably be about right, maybe a little bit before then. Um, uh, I know it, it's... Let's try uh, for 530. It's definitely a good, a good thing to try for. Um, Christina, can you... We talked about making a slide uh, to share to just let folks know if they join, although it's kind of late to be joining um, that we're in executive session. Yes. Okay, is there anything else we need to cover before we jump on the other line that we have for this purpose? Just make sure you exit this line so nobody's overhearing. All right, so we're back on record in the open session uh, the board has voted to come out of ex executive session, and board member Lunge has, uh, I believe, two questions that relate to non-confidential materials. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Garland, could you uh, give us an update on how the fixed perspective payment program is going in your ACO program? Yeah, uh, it's going very well. A little slower than we would have liked, but we launched the program in April of this past year, uh, only one hospital was able to, to sign up in April. Um, we have a few others that are very interested in participating, but they've been dealing with some internal IT challenges um, that have taken them a little bit uh, longer to resolve than they were hope, hoping for, and they want to be stable uh, on their new platforms before they take the leap. Um, I did ask our contracting provider folks for an update on the one hospital that's participating because uh, I had a feeling you were going to ask. And um, it's been a little over a month and or two months, I guess, and the uh, the feedback is so far so good. They seem to be happy. So it's a great step forward. Great. Um, and I'm glad you have more interest. Uh, my other question was, um, in previous testimony, we heard about utilization um, assumptions resulting from um, some understanding that hospitals were doing procedures uh, on weekends or after hours, and I haven't been able to get an answer on the source of that information specifically. Which hospitals have you talked to that, you know, some specifics? Um, can I make that a follow-up? Yeah. We can just put together a document and we'll, we'll send that over to you. I, I don't have all that detail off the top of my head. I apologize. Nope, that's totally fine. Um, and I'm sorry, Mike, I had one more, which was in terms of the delay of the cost containment programs that resulted from COVID, um, can you speak to when you would anticipate resuming those programs? And if not soon, what the rationale for that is? Yeah, so what we're really talking about there is is new cost containment programs. I know, I know Dr. McIntosh mentioned a few sort of small programs that got 
that got uh, sidetracked during COVID, but we're, we're largely talking about new programming. And the reason for it being sidetracked, frankly, is it takes a lot of attention on the, the plan side and the provider side to make one of these initiatives work and to make it effective. So, um, I mean, the reality is the providers just didn't have the capacity to focus on this with us over the last few months. I, I would say that um, as soon as they do have the capacity, we'll begin working on those things again. Um, Okay, I was specifically yeah. referring to two programs that were included in the 2019 rates uh, that in the actuarial memorandum indicated that they had been discontinued for the time being due to COVID. But if, you, if it'd be helpful to follow up on that, that's totally fine as well. Yeah, I, I think it would. And then we can provide a detailed written answer. Thank you. Okay, are, are we ready to move to... Dave Dillon's testimony. Jay and, and Bridget. I have nothing further. Thanks. Yes, I'm ready for Dave Dillon's testimony. Um, I think Mr. Dillon had to leave. Nope, I see him on the computer still, uh, but he might be on his phone and not have the binders available. Dave, what what is your... Yeah, so uh, I, I got kicked out of where I was, and now I'm piggybacking off of Starbucks Wi-Fi, so I will be as good as long as my Starbucks Wi-Fi holds on. Um, so we are free to proceed. If I get a bad connection, please let me know, and I'll discontinue the video and just do audio. Okay, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Hey, Amron. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Do Hello. you have your binders with you still? I do. It may take me a second, but they are with me. Okay, great. <laughs> Could you please state your full name for the record and tell us your employer? Uh, yes, I, I'm Dave Dillon. I'm Senior Vice uh, President and Principal with Lewis and & Ellis. And could you please turn to Exhibit 16? Okay, I am there. And do you recognize this document? I do. It is my pre-filed testimony. And could you briefly describe the information that's in Exhibit 16? Yeah, so it basically goes through uh, and discusses the process that uh, LNE uh, goes through in terms of, you know, the assumptions we review, the process we have in place, and our communication uh, mechanisms uh, with Blue Cross. Okay. And is the information in this document accurate and correct to the best of your knowledge? It is. And is there anything in this document that you would like to change or clarify at this time? No, there is not. And do you wish to adopt this pre-filed testimony as your testimony here today? I do. Thank you. So I know you covered this briefly in the pre-filed testimony, but just a few sentences if you could explain your role in reviewing this filing. Yeah, sure. So the process we have in place is we have three credentialed actuaries assigned to each review. Uh, Kevin Ruggeberg uh, was the primary reviewer. Um, I am what I, we call the kind of primary peer reviewer. And then Miss Jacqueline Lee is the secondary peer reviewer. Um, so in my role, um, I review the filing. Um, then I coordinate with Kevin uh, to, you know, to coordinate with him on what he's seeing with the filing. Do I agree? Um, and then we'll discuss uh, the questions that are submitted to Blue Cross. Um, and then once we get those answers, we'll assess that and determine if further questions are necessary and or then we'll make our um, recommendation that you'll see in the report based on that correspondence uh, between Kevin, myself and, and Ms. Lee. And the memo that you mentioned, is that exhibit nine of this hearing binder? It is. Could you turn to that please? Okay. It's page three specifically. Okay, I am there. Okay, uh, you see there's a standard of review at the top of the page. Is that l &E standard of review or is that the board's standard of review? That is the board's uh, standard of review. Um, our, while we do everything we can to assist the board, uh, we do primarily focus on just a subset of that review. Um, that is the, you know, excessive um, 
an inadequacy and the unfairly discriminatory pieces of, of that standard. Okay. So when we hear testimony about affordability, did l &E review this filing for affordability? We did not. Okay. So moving to recommendations, uh, which I believe are on page 23 of that exhibit. Okay. Uh, what are the recommendations that uh, l &E made with regard to this filing? Sure. We made six recommendations. Um, I would say a couple of them are, are kind of um, corrections of some minor errors. Um, there was a weighted average trend correction. Um, as we went through the filing, there, there was a, a slight miscalculation. Um, so we recommend fixing that. Um, the URRT, which is the federal federally required document, there, there was a, a, a minor error there. That is, uh, we're recommending a, an update to that. That does not affect the rates. Um, we, we talk about the, the uh, hospital budget information, which has been talked about quite a bit today, but uh, because that is unknown, we are basic, basically recommending that when it is known, that needs to be implemented. If it's an up, down, or sideways, it needs to be implemented um, once that uh, hospital budget review is complete. Um, we talk about updated risk adjustment. Um, that is a process uh, you know, where the company does not have full information about the marketplace. Um, we made an estimate. We actually um, got CMS's information this Friday. Um, so we have that final information as well. So we recommend uh, using that. Um, we may, we also uh, make a recommendation against uh, about the credit card fees. Uh, there was a minor discrepancy there that we recommend needs to get um, cleaned up a little bit. Um, and then utilization trend. Uh, Mr. Schultz mentioned that earlier today that we had a slight disagreement on a couple of the assumptions regarding utilization trend. So we made that recommendation and Blue Cross um, has agreed to make that change at this point. So if all of these recommendations are implemented, then uh, could you explain what the ultimate projected rate increase would be? Yeah, so it would go from 6.3% to 5.5%. Uh, and at that point, so our recommendation, our report states that we believe that that rate increase would not be excessive. Uh, we believe it'd be adequate and we believe it'd be, uh, it would not be unfairly discriminatory. Turning to some of the testimony today, were you able to listen to all of that testimony? Had a few minor connectivity issues, but I think I got the bulk of it, yes. Okay. Uh, in your uh, you stated in your pre-filed testimony that you review several ACA filings a year. So given the a lot of the testimony that today about the COVID-19 impacts, could you give us a brief summary of what other carriers are assuming regarding the impact of COVID-19? Sure. So to date, I have reviewed and my team has reviewed about 50 filings. Um, and that's a combination of individual and small group. Um, so a little bit of differences there, but essentially we're seeing a range of COVID impacts uh, between 0% impact uh, to about 3 to 4% is the normal range that we are seeing. Um, as you guys are well aware that, you know, I, I'd be hesitant to m extrapolate that answer to Vermont because Vermont is very distinct, but it does help to give some context uh, to see what others are saying, and we're seeing zero to four percent. We have seen a few others slightly higher than that. We've seen as up upwards as eight percent for COVID. However, that seems to be limited to one parent company and their affiliates in, in multiple states. And what did you say in your memo specifically about Blue Cross's assumption regarding the COVID-19 impact? So we reviewed um, the additional, uh, the original documentation. We only had a few days to review, but we did state in the report um, that we believe that their modeling approach to assess their wide range of scenarios was reasonable and appropriate. Uh, we did feel that all of the issues that should have been addressed were included in the modeling. Uh, so we did believe that it, it was a reasonable approach. And since issuing the report, have you reviewed the information Blue Cross submitted um, both right before your report was issued and then also the newer modeling they submitted last week? Uh, yes, we have reviewed, um, you know, and essentially that was an update to their, their modeling based on June claims data being added. Um, we've reviewed that and we believe that their model uh, and their testing is still, uh, still reasonable and appropriate. 
Okay, so having um, reviewed the supplemental material and listened to testimony today, is there anything that you would wish to change or add to your recommendation around CTR? Uh, no, I, I, I do not. Um, we, we believe, as we said, um, you know, the CTR um, was reasonable. Um, we've provided some metrics. Those have been discussed today. Um, I, I do think, um, you know, uncertainty is something that actuaries would tend to increase a CTR for. Um, and we're obviously living in a, in a very high, high uncertain um, environment right now. Um, so I do think there could be some downward pressure um, on that, but I do still believe it is it is reasonable based on Blue Cross's um, historical results of projecting the impact that if, if they believe that the 1.5 is still appropriate, we still believe it is reasonable. Thank you. And uh, just to cover everything you've heard today, is there anything else that you heard or have read since your report was issued that would uh, make you want to change anything with regard to your other recommendations? No, there is not. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, um, Ms. AC or Mr. Nofri, do you have questions for Mr. Dillon? Uh, no questions at this time. I'd just like to reserve the right um, to ask perhaps a couple of clarifying questions based on any further testimony. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Angoff. Yes, just a few. Mr. Dillon, could you? Uh, Turn to exhibit nine, please. Okay. I am there. What page? First page. Okay. And on that page, you see that little table at the bottom, right? Yes. Okay. And it shows Blue Cross's members dropping from 70,000 in 2017 to, 20, to 39,000 in 2020, right? Correct. To, to what do you attribute that? <laughs> so there's obviously a lot of factors there. Um, I, I believe the major consideration as we review the, both filings is that Blue Cross, when we started this process a few years ago, um, they had a sicker population um, than MVP. And over the last couple of years, that, has, um, that trend has continued. Um, so... Um, and they also have more uh, platinum members, which is also somewhat indicative of the health status of their population. Um, so that tends to um, increase rates. And while risk adjustment does compensate for some of that, it doesn't compensate for every condition. And so I think that is the primary reason uh, for that reduction. Did you ever consider the possibility that if their rates were lower, they wouldn't have lost so much business? So while that is a theory out there in my years of an actuary, I've never seen a, if we build it, they will come type approach work. Um, usually if you race to the bottom, you usually end up at the bottom. Is the, is the current trend though sustainable? Can Blue Cross continue to lose this much business, one seventh of its business for the last three years? So while I have not um, done a formal enrollment projection myself over the next few years. Um, I do anticipate that uh, the two market players could end up in somewhat of a stasis in terms of MVP having somewhat healthier population. And we've gone through the, the growing pains of the transition and Blue Cross could end up in a fairly steady state situation similar to the way it is now. And by stasis, you mean they each have half the market? Um, now, I don't necessarily mean stasis in terms of a percentage. It could be the same percentage now, or it could be some other percentage. Um, but I don't think it's, it, you know, we're definitely not on a path where Blue Cross is going to zero and MVP is 100. I think we're going to hit a point where the sicker population will stay with their providers um, under the Blue Cross plan and the healthier people, you know, could end up and, and stay with MVP. Could you turn... Please to page 16 of exhibit nine. Okay. Okay, you there? I am there. Okay. And you see at the very bottom, the last paragraph, you see it says that you did an informal review of uh, Blue Cross's COVID projections. You see that? Yes. What did that informal review consist of? So 
the, the informal review was primarily informed based on uh, my experience with the SOA model um, that the Society of Actuaries has put out. So I have done some diligence. Um, while I have not done any formal COVID testing, I'm very familiar with the Society of Actuaries model and um, the assumptions that went into that. And so when I saw the Blue Cross model, I was relatively informed in terms of you know, deferral rates and costs and things like that. Did you review the, did, did you review the Blue Cross addendum? Did you review the, the page by page, the Blue Cross addendum? Yes, I have reviewed the addendum. Okay. And uh, then on the next, the, the top of the next page, it says that you uh you did a cursory review of Blue Cross's documentation. What did that cursory review consist of? So I think the cursory review is is just a synonym for the informal review that we did um, do, um, just reviewing to make sure that those assumptions lined up with what we would expect. Okay, but you didn't do you didn't do your own calculations. You didn't look behind the data at all, correct? Um, no, correct. Um, we reviewed things such as. Um, you know, they're assumed deferral rates and, um, you know, did an informal review based on what we have seen in those, you know, eight of nine other states and with our work with the Society of Actuaries model. Okay. Um, what, if anything, did you do to review the investment that Blue Cross made that lost $40 million? Uh, we did not do any review. Um, it is not typically an actuarial exercise to um, on the investment side. So we did not um, conduct a review there. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the board? I'll just skip the roll call. Does any board member have a question for Mr. Dillon? Um, I have a question. Um, hi, Dave. Just hi. a question on um, when you go to page uh, 13 and 20, I guess, I guess, um, Page 20, sorry. Page I, 20? I'm number 13. Yeah, 13 and 20 doesn't make sense. I guess that's getting late. <laughs> Item 13, <laughs> uh, page 20. Sure. And when we talk about the administrative costs, I guess first in the buildup of the 7.3% that Blue Cross Blue Shield requested, 1% of that increase is driven by their increase in administrative costs. So it is fairly significant to, to what's driving uh, part of the change. And when you look at, um, you compare them to Blue Cross Blue Shield based on Blue Cross Blue Sh other blue plans, both on an administrative PMPM -PM and where they rank. And when we look at, I guess the question would be maybe Blue Cross Blue Shield plans are all high. And, and when we look at MVP, um, it's significantly lower on a PMPM -PM basis and a change. So it's, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is about 12% higher um, on their dollar fee. So just wondering if you can give a perspective on how blue plans compare to other plans across the country, and then why wouldn't we look just in our local market as well um, on a you know comparative basis? Sure. So I would say generally speaking, there's a couple dynamics uh, at play there. I think one is the Blue Cross plans do tend to be sicker, tend to have more claims, um, so that is one factor. And then generally speaking, most Blue Cross plans do tend to be regional sing or single state. There are a few exceptions. Uh, but because of that, um, the, the smaller blues don't have as big a you know, membership base to spread their admin as compared to the large insurers that are more national or super regional. So I, I think those are two considerations that, that, we that we take into consideration when we evaluate, let's say, a single state uh, blues plan. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. Yep. Any other board members? Okay, Mike, did you have questions? Follow up? Mike D'Onofrio? I do not. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dillon. Thank you. Enjoy your vacation. I will. Thank you. Glad the video held up. Uh, so the next witness I have is uh, Mike Fisher, Chief Healthcare Advocate. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Or good evening, me, maybe I should say. <laughs> Let me just take a minute to pin you to <clears throat> my screen here. Are you ready to take the oath? Sure. Yes. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Okay, Mr. Ango. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh. Uh, oh, did was were you going to ask questions or was this going to be a? Yeah, we thought that uh, Mr. Fisher would proceed in the same manner as uh, Commissioner Tichet did. Any objections from Blue Cross? Uh, no objection. No, no objection. Okay, Mr. Fisher, go ahead. Thank you, uh, board, and thank you, everyone who's stuck with this um, endurance test today. Today's been a marathon. Um, I guess I want to start with a, a, a little apology. Um, I just want to recognize that I am experiencing um, a level of outrage that um, I would usually try and hold in check um, for an event like this. Um, it's an outrage about the disconnect between the level of fear and the real harm that I believe Vermonters and small businesses and, uh, and Vermont families, families are experiencing and how much the discussion uh, and the discussion that's taking place here today. Uh, you know, thank you, Blue Cross, for recognizing that we are in unprecedented times in the opening. But wow, I don't know how to reconcile these two worlds. It, it, it's a bit baffling to me. Um, the board's decision, uh, the board's words in the decision on the uh, on the Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont large group um, have a couple of interesting important concepts that I just want to uh, repeat and agree with. Um, I agree that it is the task to strike the appropriate balance between achieving the most affordable rates possible while also safeguarding solvency. I also agree that the pandemic has only exacerbated the inherent tension in our rate review criteria. Rising insurance rates in the midst of this unprecedented crisis will compound the difficulties Vermonters are facing and make it less likely that they can afford to access the care they need. Yeah, these are unprecedented times. While we've seen some recent improvements in the unemployment numbers, um, the numbers are still phenomenally troubling. Um, this coupled with the ending of the federal subsidy for unemployment this week adds to a new level of fear and a new level of pain. Vermont's dependence on tourism adds to this challenge. Increased costs of uh, basic living expenses, again, piles on the pain. If the challenge of setting a carrier rate is balanced between insured solvency and affordability, the challenge facing Vermonters represents a significant tipping of that balance. On the other hand, if we accept the often repeated concept that affordability is something that you get to consider after you've made sure the insurance company is uh, is whole, um, wow, we're in for more trouble than we're in for real trouble. You know, if, if that's the logic, more and more uh, we are going to have uh, rates that may be actuarially, actuarially sound, um, but fewer and fewer Vermonters can actually afford. Uh, yes, in response to something Paul Schultz said earlier today, it is affordability on the community level that I'm talking about here. No, in the middle of a pandemic with substantial financial impacts on Vermonters, in an environment where there's been substantial sacrifice, this is a time, if there ever is a time, when we must pay special attention to the needs of our small businesses and Vermont families. A few people have referenced the comments. Um, I know that the board members will, if they haven't, uh, take some time to read them. Um, 
I, I want to say a special thank you to all of the over 800 Vermonters who have commented. Uh, Vermonters are paying attention. Um, I appreciate them for taking the time uh, to write so many thoughtful and detailed comments. Uh, when taken together, this is an impressive storytelling exercise. It provides an important opportunity to have a view into the broader set of Vermonters' lives. I won't read all of them today, um, but I will take a moment to recognize a few themes. Um, one person said, my family has been unable to access care for almost four months. Although I'm still paying the same premiums, what has Blue Cross Blue Shield done for their insured Vermonters this year, aside from collect premiums? For my family, the answer is nothing. Another person said, a lot of Vermonters don't Sorry, go to the doctors. I, I hate to interrupt, but I I just need to re my computer just started. Um, ah. Just give me one second. I need to restart. Thank you. Yeah, why don't we take take five minutes and take a bathroom break and come back at um, 6.38? So I'll continue. Yes, please. So I was spending a moment talking about some of the comments that came in. Um, another person said, a lot of Vermonters didn't go to the doctor this year because of COVID-19. I didn't go at all this year. So if you don't go to the doctor, when Blue Cross Blue Shield receives a lot of money without having to pay for any services, so why do they need to raise their premiums? I don't say these two because they're, I mean to hold them out as individual ones. I say them because they were a theme. Many people said something similar to that. And we heard stories like that at the Healthcare Advocates Office. There was a lot of Vermonters have had the experience of not being able to get the care they need and um, struggling to pay their premiums. There was, of course, another theme, and that was about um, the financial pressures. And I'll just say a few words I pulled out of the comments, and those words included uh, cruel, appalled, unsustainable, unethical, um, to describe the situation as they see it. Um, Another thing we hear a lot from Vermonters is the level of fear that people are experiencing. Uh, this is a palpable fear that is driving some of their decisions. Um, and I say that in lead to the next question that I've heard many people say today, we don't know exactly what the incidence rate of, uh, of the virus will be going forward. I agree, we don't know. Um, and while I'm sure it's true that our providers have gotten better at serving the needs of the COVID positive population and the, and the non-COVID care, I also know that with an increased rate of infection comes fear. And I don't have any doubt that if there was another spike of coronavirus uh, in the re remainder of this year or next year, that it would come with a uh, uh, a decrease in non-COVID care. And then lastly, about a uh, the, the future incidence um, of COVID, it, I think this has been alluded to, but I don't think it's been made as clear as I think it needs to be. Um, Exhibit 19 uh, make, uh, clearly spells out, this is the health department's um, description of the incidence of the disease clearly spells out both um, the uh, the number of infections by age and the number of hospitalizations by age. And there, as we all know, there is a very heavy weighting towards the older population and more specifically the above 65, the Medicare population. <clears throat> Lastly, um, I've listened to the testimony today about the need for reserves. Um, 
I've heard the statement again and again in past years and again this year, insurance, insurer solvency is the most important consumer protection strategy. Um, I don't know what to say. Does that mean that, that consumers are okay if the insurers have enough money? Um, do you think anyone outside of, I guess the people on this call, um, would buy that reasoning? Um, it just doesn't add up. Uh, I hear how important it is to Blue Cross to hold all that money, but I don't think there's any scenario um, that they, or the industry for that matter, uh, would accept a, as a reason to spend some of that money, as a reason why, you know what, now is not the time to build reserves. Now is the time to make sure people get care. Um, so I, I have to admit, I'm going to say something that, that you know, uh, uh, I, I don't understand what insurer, uh, what a surplus or what a member reserves is for. Uh, for year after year, we've heard, um, well, of course we need to hold on to this money. What if we have a pandemic? Well, here we are. Maybe member reserves are, by definition, only for a future need, never for a now need. Or maybe member reserves are really important for something that I'm not entertaining. Maybe it's important for Wall Street. Um, you know, or some some Wall Street rating purpose. Um, Vermonters are struggling in an unprecedented fashion. Claims are down for the year. There's been a sizable injection of unanticipated revenue due to tax rebates and legal actions, and we're contemplating raising rates. Members of the board, it's raining. <laughs> it's raining here in Vermont uh, and across the country. Um, doesn't look like it. Um, in fact, it's really a hurricane. And Vermonters are looking for a little shelter. Um, as a point of, point of comparison, no, none of us will know what's going to happen in the state budget um, process for the next three months, uh, the remaining three, um, sorry, the remaining three quarters uh, of the fiscal year. But imagine for a moment if the legislature and the governor decided to leave the state reserves intact um, and instead passed a tax increase to add more money. Um, I don't think any of us entertain that that's even a possibility. I don't think it is a possibility. I don't think that that could possibly happen today. Is this entirely all that different? Given the world of hurt that is playing out in Vermont small businesses and in Vermont families, the discussion of a rate increase is baffling. I, I, I'll say it, to me, feels tone deaf. Um, we at the HCA usually end with uh, don't raise the rates as much as the carrier asks for. Um, we're going further today. Um, uh, I, I will join with what some have said before. Now is not the time for any rate increase. Now is the time for a level, uh, for a 0% rate increase. And, um, and I thank you for taking the time to do this very long hearing and for listening to me at the end of this day. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Mr. D'Onofre or Ms. AC, do you have any questions? No questions. Board members? I have one. Uh, Mike, are you familiar with the federal requirements for exchange plans and actuarial certifications? Um, the specifics of which, no. Um, but I am aware of the, um, well, I am aware of the, of the, all of the discussion about the requirements for reserves, if that's what you mean. Uh, well, if you could um, include perhaps in your legal memorandum how your request meets the federal requirements that are rate the actuarially sound, that would be very helpful. Okay. Okay, are we ready to move on to closing statements? Yes. 
Mr. Angoff? Yes, sir. Okay, then I think Mr. Nafrio, you get to go first. Sure. Um, I'm going to try to be incredibly brief, uh, recognizing that we do have the opportunity to file a post-hearing memo where we'll really try to address the, the incredible um, breadth and scope of the testimony and, and evidence you've heard today. Um, I want to start kind of where Mr. Fisher started with some of the language from your decision earlier today from the large group um, matter. And I'm, I'm going to quote, Raising insurance rates in the midst of this unprecedented crisis will compound the difficulties Vermonters are facing and make it less likely that they can afford to access the care they need. The pandemic has also created an additional layer of uncertainty and made it difficult to predict health care costs over the next year. Insurers, as well as providers, are having to make plans and propose rates and budgets based on still emerging information in what is a very fluid and potentially volatile situation. This uncertainty implicates solvency and the need for insurers to be able to absorb future costs that are not currently known or quantifiable. And that's the end of the quote. Um, that's sort of a perfect frame for, for where we are today. Um, the, the, the actuarially justified rate increase before you, and there's really been no serious dispute on an actuarial level. There, there's agreement among um, Blue Cross's actuaries, the board's actuaries, and uh, and the Department of Financial Regulations actuaries. Um, when you put that next to a few undisputed facts that you heard today, I think that it, it argues, it, it demonstrates why approving the rate as proposed and as modified by l &E is the right result. Now, first, Blue Cross chose, um, when the pandemic hit back in March, not to ask policyholders to foot the bill for the health care costs related to the pandemic. As, as Mr. Fisher noted, you've been told again and again, this is what reserves are for. And Blue Cross has used its reserves in exactly that way. The fact that Mr. Fisher overlooked, Blue Cross has spent about $10 million of those reserves to cover those health care costs, which effectively um, reduced what the rate would have otherwise been by 3.2%. And that's undisputed. Um, Blue Cross has also chosen not to seek um, anything in this rate related to the pension loss. And as Commissioner Pichak testified, that, like the pandemic itself, those are two events that are going to play out over time and, 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 will dic and, and will dictate, at some point, a move up or down in the rates. Um, you've also heard that Blue Cross has continued to keep its cost of insurance, the, the element of these actuarially justified rates over which it has the most control at, at industry low levels. And you've also heard that Blue Cross has, has given you the best evidence that you have in this record in terms of how the pandemic might play out and what that might look like um, projecting into the future a couple of years. The, the HCA's position that I think is uh, perhaps most clearly framed in Mr. Angoff's opening and in the, the questioning of Ruth Green would actually, it would in, increase the volatility and increase the uncertainty that's causing so much fear for Vermonters. Essentially what the HCA is asking you to do is not to take that long view, but to respond in the moment as events take place, events like the pension loss, events like the pandemic. Blue Cross, by, by um, making the decisions it's made, not to put the pandemic costs in these rates, not to put the pension loss in these rates, is, is giving you a path towards stability in the healthcare system in this time of tremendous uncertainty and instability. Um, Blue Cross has protected the health and wellness of Vermonters for over 40 years by, by providing prudent financial management, outstanding customer service, first-class health care insurance coverage in the most cost-efficient manner possible. And these rates before you are consistent with that history. Um, so to conclude, I, on behalf of Blue Cross and on behalf of my colleague, Ms. Acey, um, I want to thank you board members for hanging in. I want to thank the HCA team and, and everyone's staff for hanging in. Um, and I request that you um, reject the, the HCA's logic here and approve the proposed rates as modified by Eleni's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Angoff.
Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer, and thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. Four points. Number one, I hate to say it, but this system is not working. Every year since the board has been constituted, Blue Cross comes in for an increase. LNA, let's face it, essentially rubber stamps it. You know, it does a little, a little, a tiny bit of reduction, but it's essentially a rubber stamp. Blue Cross gets essentially what it asks for. And despite that, Blue Cross's just in the last four years, enrollment has gone from 70,000 to 39,000. So the system has not worked for Blue Cross. And clearly it has not worked for Vermonters who just every year, as if rate increases were some kind of natural law, every year pay more to Blue Cross. Number two, Blue Cross's rate filing this year is particularly unreasonable, particularly unjustified. One of the big reasons is that their projections of what will happen as a result of the coronavirus are completely unreasonable. Vermont has been the best in the country. Vermont is a great success story. Vermonters, at a lot of sacrifice to themselves, and a lot of suffering have done a sensational job of containing the coronavirus. Yet the comparables that Blue Cross puts into its model include suburban New York, Westchester County, and Boston, not New Hampshire, not Maine, but their comparables aren't comparable. In addition, Blue Cross's estimate of how much RBC will be improved is completely unreasonable. And who says that? Not the HCA, but Oliver Wyman. Oliver Wyman is not some far left consumer oriented advocate. They are a very, very conservative, respected actuarial firm. They say the effect of the coronavirus will be to raise, on average, raise plans throughout the country's RBC by between 21 and 105 points. That's the average. Vermont is better than average. Vermont's not just better than average, Vermont is the best. So Vermont should be on the upside of that, should be the 105 points, not the zero that Blue Cross uh, assumes. Third point, and this is the most troubling to me, the board is much, much more magnanimous about this than I would be. You have given Blue Cross increases year after year after year, pretty much what they asked for. You asked very reasonable questions, essential questions. You guys lost 40 to the, uh, along the lines of, you guys lost $40 million. Tell us how you did it. Tell us what you did with that money. And Blue Cross does a couple of things. Number one, they don't answer the questions you ask. Number two, they simply give you a six-page general uh, filing, which doesn't answer, answer the questions you ask. And I guess the most troubling thing to me is the CEO writes you a letter, a page and a half letter, just a couple of weeks ago, the tone being, oh, by the way, we had, we, we, not we lost, but our assets experienced a $40 million loss, as if it's the assets fault, as if Blue Cross did nothing. They tell you that a couple of weeks ago, they knew about this in March. And what I found, found most appalling was the commissioner, and there's no reflection on the commissioner, but the commissioner was talking about, when he testified, discussing the issue with the Blue Cross CEO. And he said, essentially, it never occurred to us to notify the board. You all are the ones who give Blue Cross the money they asked for. And Blue Cross won't even give you the courtesy of answering your questions. Fourth point, 
There is no natural law that rates must be increased this year. This year, Blue Cross has behaved particularly badly, and Vermonters have behaved particularly well at great cost to themselves, at great sacrifice. This year, for the first time, the board should order no increase. I believe a decrease is justified, but for the first time, let's have no increase for Blue Cross. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the board. You've been very patient. So I think the only thing I need to resolve is there's a uh, motion or request to extend the page limit on the post-hearing memo, which I'm granting still due on the same date. Is there anything else we need to discuss before we head off back home? Or I head off back home, sorry. You guys are home. <laughs> no. I have How many additional further. pages are you granting? Five. Okay. Mike, do we need to have a public comment period before finishing? Yes, we do. Thank you, Thank you for reminding me. Um, so at this time, is there any member of the public who stuck with us and has uh, a comment that they'd like to make? Can we also point out that um, there's also the opportunity tomorrow night, starting at 4.30, to offer any public comment on either this um, rate request or MVPs, in that um, if people feel the need to get dinner rather than commenting tonight, tomorrow might be the better spot. Yeah, I don't... Uh, how do we... Um ask to be recognized oh um just state your name um and and provide your comment yes it's audrey garfield i live in brattleboro vermont i'm a consumer uh and i i have questions actually i'm curious um what board members understanding of affordability for insurance is currently for vermonters Um, so if any board member wishes to try and tackle that, um, they can, uh, but uh, your name again was? Audrey Garfield. Uh, Ms. Garfield, um, this is a, a, a time to, to provide comment, um, so um, okay. not questions, but if the board would like to try and say something, you have the opportunity. So I, I would just say this, that um, the board struggles every year because um, under the statute, we're tasked with making sure that um, it meets the affordability criteria, but also tasked with making sure um, that it promotes insurer solvency. And the two do not align and therefore, um, often um, insurers uh, will make the argument that um, they were not given a rate that um, that actually promotes insurer solvency. And the public um, makes the argument that they were not given a rate that is affordable. Um, I have said previously in numerous um, public venues that I don't believe the existing insurance rates are affordable and that's without any increase. So as a percentage of uh, Vermonters income, I think uh, the rates are problematic, especially in a key demographic because um, those under 400% of the poverty level um, are given um, help from the federal government in making their payments. But once you hit that cliff, it is a cliff and it's very difficult for people who are working very hard every single day to try to make the uh, payments once they've hit that threshold. So it's um, not something that um, is an easy factor for the board to weigh because it's in direct conflict with another factor that we are both tasked with under the statute. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate you responding to my question. And, you know, I, I again, I will, I have many questions. I'm a lay person, but because this is public comment and not a question and answer period, I'll try to limit my, um, uh, my comments to comments. And, um, you know, the idea of solvency, again, I'm a lay person. I'm looking at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield statutory statements of assets and liabilities. And I see that at the end of 2019, they had assets of almost $300 million, which was a $40 million increase over a year. And I really appreciate what the prior speaker had to say that each year, um, the board consistently gives Blue Cross Blue Shield what they want. And uh, to listen to Mr. Dillon talk about affordability, I, I have to ask affordability for whom, really? Uh, it's a house of cards. And perhaps the best thing that can happen is that the board continues to give Blue Cross Blue Shield what they want until the whole system crumbles, because that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, it's incredibly frustrating uh, that, you know, the idea that this balance or imbalance of solvency versus affordability is in direct conflict with the board's purpose of improving, improving the health of Vermonters. And Vermonters are suffering. We used to, I used to be really proud of Vermont and our ability to provide insurance for, for everybody. And that's changed. Um, and I just don't see how Vermonters, especially given uh, the rates of unemployment, the fact that unprecedented numbers of Vermonters are food insecure. Um, you know, I myself last year was unemployed for a period of time. I was on unemployment. I went without insurance for nine months because I couldn't afford to be insured through the, through, uh, the Vermont Health Connect. And so here I am groveling before this board who holds the fate of Vermonters in its hands. And it seems like an exercise in futility. It seems like a foregone conclusion that, um, you know, I don't think a lot of us Vermonters have much faith in this process, and that is unfortunate. So thank you for your time. And I, I, I ask you to think, to consider Vermonters more in this equation. Uh, you may not hear from as many of us. We may not have as strong a voice as Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but we're here. And, you know, we're for those of us who aren't here, it's because we're working our second jobs or taking care of our children or trying to make ends meet with pennies. So please consider that in your decision this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any, anyone else who would like to make a comment? I, I would. Is that Dale? Yes. Hi Dale, go ahead. Uh, I've been listening since 10 o'clock this morning, so there's just a few highlights that I picked up on. Blue Cross Blue Shield expects Green Mountain Care Board to consider reserves when setting rates to consider their solvency. Yet they lose money, uh, sorry, they lose money, they say, when the rate is too low. But Blue Cross Blue Shield does not hold itself accountable to explain its management of the reserves in the pension fund as if that too can also be money that came from somewhere did it come from the consumer and granted there's legal implications why they may not be able to answer some questions but it was striking to see how they were refusing to take responsibility for its act their actions and answering public questions can they write a better reply as an explanation of what happened? Be transparent as soon as possible with the facts. At least share what you learned from the mistake or bad decision. I would ask the board to set the rate as if the 40 million still existed since they may get something on um, something back from what they lost. It's up to Blue Cross Blue Shield to find the 40 million not Vermont, nor consumers without better answers than given. I would also comment that in with COVID going on, 
there is something that's happening I didn't hear it mentioned once, and that is an in, inadvertent rationing of care. For example, if you need a doctor's appointment, they can only see so many people per day. And that scenario, if you need a doctor's appointment and it's got to be within three days because of the medical issue, you're probably going to the ER. I know I've actually had it happen. Um, there is no other option. I asked and the ER becomes the doctor's appointment as well as the place you go for more urgent needs. Rates have to support the consumer and 5% annual increase does not support consumers. Blue Cross Blue Shield solvency has become the primary issue, but is it more important than the consumer solvency? If they do get this rate increase, I would hope that someone at least considers and will testify to the impact to the consumers above 400% and below 400%, I would also hope that it is considered when looking at hospital rates, will that be as supportive in making sure that they stay solvent? And that's both on the side of the Green Mountain Care Board looking at their rates and what will Blue Cross Blue Shield do in negotiating rates with providers, hospitals, et cetera. Will they also consider the solvency issue of the hospitals? I'm not saying they haven't. I'm just saying going forward, we can't drop the ball. We have to stay with the issues. Um, and that's it. That was just a few highlights I picked up on. Okay, thank you, Dale. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment? I don't hear anyone, so um, just, yeah, again, a reminder that uh, we are having a forum specifically for comments tomorrow, starting at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, via Teams. The information for that is on our website under the rate review tab. Um, probably in a couple different places, but I know it's there. Um, and I think we're going to wrap up and see you guys tomorrow at 8. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Hearing Officer, for steering us through a very long day. Thanks. Do we need a motion to adjourn? That's a good point. Yes, you do. So move. Second. Second. Uh, me? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. <laughs> Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Now I'll see you guys at eight. Bye. Bye.